Hello and welcome to the first in a series of international virtual town hall exclusive panel discussion on the African Express publications. In today's series, we will be discussing the ongoing investigative report on corruption and financial crimes against President, President B.O. administration in Sierra Leone. We have come a long way as a country in a couple of days, Sierra Leone will be 60 years of independence. And you can all agree with me that corruption has been a deterrent to development in Sierra Leone for the past 60 years. Joining me today on the panel is Patrick Umbulu, PhD candidate, Northwest University Associate Editor, African Express. Welcome, Patrick. Thanks for having me. Joining me again is Dr. Ann Wallis, Associate Professor, University of Louisville, an epidemiologist and director of publications, African Express. Welcome, Dr. Ann. Thank you very much. I have uh, with me again, Cherno Alpha Emba, PhD candidate, Northwest University, and editor in chief, African Express. Cherno, welcome. Thank you, very <clears throat> Thank you very much for organizing this. I also have with me to discuss Dr. Sanu Umar, Umar Bari, head of the Gambia Commission on Human Rights. Welcome, Dr. Bari. I want to take this opportunity to recognize our distinguished guests, representatives, and heads of political parties, um, the Unity Party, the APC Party, NGC, C4C, present here today on this panel discussion. The discussion will start with an interview, followed by a question and answer session, where in viewers will ask um, uh, questions, and the guests and representatives from political parties 
will also engage the panelists with their questions. This program is produced and powered by the Tele to Rachel TV network, of which I am the CEO, and I am your host for today's program. Once again, you are all welcome. And if you're just joining in, please share the video. Please share the video. And ladies, if you can, ladies and gentlemen, if you can all hear me loud and clear, can I see your hands up, please? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right, let, let's, let me go to you, um, Sharon Abba. Let's start with you. Um, can you give us a summary? Because uh, we everybody is seeing Africanist your post, especially from Chernoba on um, Facebook all the time. So can you please give us um, a summary of who Africanist Press is? <clears throat> Thank you very much once again for um organizing this all-important um, virtual panel. And I want to thank um, everyone who has um, took upon their time to be present for this conversation. And again, um, I salute my um, friends and colleagues in the African Express for um, working through this. Like you said, the African Express is an independent um, media organization which uh, focuses on aspects of free speech, improving governance, and also um, highlighting or fighting against corruption and um, um, the protection of um, human rights, especially the rights of journalists to practice as, as, as journalists on the African continent. And for the last, um, we started publishing the African Express almost 20 years now, from beginning 2001 to now. And by 2014, we expanded our network and we incorporated a book publishing aspect. And for um, this started with the release of my uh, first book on um, uh, neocolonialism in West Africa, which mostly deals with issues of governance, questions around multinationals in West Africa, mostly the countries of Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. And then we followed that up with the book with the investigation on the Ebola outbreak that came out, um, which is a critique of um, the handling of the Ebola outbreak by the Koroma administration, the Liberian government under Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, and of course, um, Guinea, which was at the center of the entire outbreak. So for the last um, two years, we developed what we called an investigative journalism project, which aims to examine um, new democracies on the continent. And for this first, force of the pro this first part of the project, we're looking at the Mano River countries of Sierra Leone, Liberia, and by extension also um, the, the Gambia in the, in the future. So our, our objective is to assess how these new democratic, what we call new democracies, especially in Liberia and Sierra Leone, have been dealing with post-war uh, development issues, issues of governance, issues around uh, fighting against corruption, issues again, issues around fiscal transparency. And beginning March 1 to now, we, myself and two of my other colleagues, Matthew Anderson and uh, Mark Feldman, have been working on the Sierra Leone component of this project as the first part of the three country project. And so far, we have published, um, I think, a total of 24 articles now, beginning March 1 which deals with um, our first articles examining the question of the uh, wage bill in Sierra Leone. And then we follow that up with highlighting evidence of um, how the payroll has increased by 45 to 55% now. Okay, let, let, so all of those issues. So basically we okay, are let, yeah. in a project staffed by academics, um, researchers and people who specialize in Africa and uh, they are also specialists in different fields. For example, like, like you mentioned, Patrick Mbulu is an anthropologist, myself as a history, uh, trainer as a historian. Uh, let me come in, let me come in. Yeah, um, thanks for letting us know um, some of the things that African Express um, is doing and has embarked on. What is the rationale? I would like to know, what is the rationale behind the, the investigating the SLPP administration? Well, it's not just the SLPP administration. We are looking at, um, it just happens that um, in this current phase, we're talking about um, Sierra Leone. 
you know, and then when you talk about in the African environment, we talk about the government of Sierra Leone per se, it might be a government that is headed or led by a political party in power. But the issues we're dealing with basically goes beyond um, just um, examining the conduct of a political party. We, we talk about polit political parties in this sense because they are the vehicles through which uh, state policies are basically implemented. So um, in the case of Sierra Leone, um, we all remember that leading up to the um, 2018 elections, the current government talked about, um, its critique was that the previous administration had um, a bloated wage bill, uh, public expenditure was, um, was way beyond the proportion of, of the national revenues of the day. So issues of corruption, fiscal uh, management of the resources and all of these were issues that everybody uh, was concerned about. So we had a government that promised, among other things, to implement discipline in public finance management. So with the current investigation, we find out that our fiscal governance must be one of the areas that we must examine. And in the process, we try basically to match the manifesto of the party that is now in government and uh, looking at what they've been able to do uh, more than uh, for the, more than two years now that they're in power, three years now that they're in power. So basically, we're trying to examine whether the current government has lived up to its manifesto promises and how that in itself deals with questions of transparency, the management of national resources, uh, you know. And um, these are aspects of governance. Basically, they deal with uh, in the quality of governance, uh, democratic dispensation, transparency questions are basically fundamental to democratic dispensation. All right. Um, before I go to, I uh, would like to talk to Anne, but before I get to Anne, let's just clear this up, uh, Chair, you know, let's talk about your publications on allocations of illegal public spending by Office of the President, Office of the First Lady, and the Chief Minister to be specific. President Bio has acknowledged that his office spent huge amounts of money, and that doesn't mean he is corrupt. As he has in, in, and his administration have always followed the due process, meaning monies are being accounted for. What what is your response to that? Well, we, nobody is let's, saying. Let's that. take it. Let's take it first from, with the first lady. Let's let's take it step by step with the publication on the first lady first. Well, I I, I think we we what we're dealing with is basically. Um, it's not a question. It's just. It's not just the question of government use this money. It's a question of um, how governments run the economies of of you know nations. So basically, in the case of Sierra Leone, we're dealing with a re a regime or a government that promised a number of things when they were campaigning. Among other things, is the minimization of public expenditure, fiscal discipline. They had this whole idea that they were going to uh, cut down the payroll, for example. They're going to um, minimize frivolous public spending, including um, wastage of public funds through international travel and all of those other things. And what the example you are now using is basically one that was even outside of the equation because we're dealing with that aspect deals with the question of illegal use of public funds. Um, that's that's a, on a separate aspect. So when you look at the number of publications we've, we've examined, it's basically to look at the manifesto of the party when they were campaigning. And now that they're in government, to examine government policies, whether they are actually being implemented, different from the rhetoric. And what we discovered is that um, there is a complete dichotomy, a difference between what government is saying about their management of the economy and what they're actually doing. In this case, um, when you look at the payroll, which is the first uh, publication, the payroll has increased by 45%. We, not, we do not just look at the increase in the payroll, we look at the factors that are responsible for the increase in the payroll. And we have said with documentary evidence that the payroll has been blown you know, astronomically by the um, large scale appointment of political party appointees who are given positions, you might call them meaningless positions, and um, um, irrational salaries. In certain cases, we've shown evidence of people who are paid as consultants $300 and $400 a day in Sierra Leone for actually doing nothing. And then we have, we've shown all these salary disparities and how the massive incorporation of political party members and supporters of the current party into various public and civil service positions 
have actually led to the increase of the payrolls. The government has not denied that. What they have said is that the payroll has increased as a consequence of the hiring of teachers and, and healthcare workers. And that evidence falls flat in face of the evidence we've, we've, we've uh, provided because they haven't shown us how many teachers they've employed, how many nurses, but we have that payroll. We also in, in, intend in future to show that. So coming to the question of the first lady, what makes that example yeah, let's get into the that specific. Very... Can I come in, um, China? Let's get let's get into the specific of the first lady first. Yes. That, um, in one of your publication, hold on, please. In one of your publication, you mentioned that the first lady of Sierra Leone have an as an account at the central bank receiving um, um, money directly from the consolidated revenue funds and a 30, about 30 billion spent on furniture. Let's get into that specific first. Yes, that is what I'm saying. Uh, before we get to the way the money was used, I think it's, it's fundamental for us to establish the fact that um, the allocation in itself is illegal. It's not supported by law. And uh, what, why, why is that important? It's because- Why is that it, important, yeah. Uh, it deals with uh, the illegal use of public money. You know, we. Uh, governments are not, or the executive branch that is in charge of managing the, the treasury hasn't got the right to use public funds without authorization from parliament. And, and, and that's, that's a universal uh, situation. Governments cannot use money without first and foremost presenting an appropriation bill, uh, budgetary estimates to parliament, seeking or showing exactly how they intend to generate money in the upcoming, for example, in the upcoming fiscal year, and how they intend to also uh, generate and use that money, seeking parliamentary approval for that kind of uh, uh, proposal. It's called the, the 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 appropriation bill. That is the you know you see that every December when the Minister of Finance goes to Parliament. So for the last um, three years that the Madabio administration has been in power, you can look at the budgetary estimates. You will find nowhere, and parliamentarians have said this. You find nowhere where. The office, what we call the office of the first lady, is listed as an expenditure uh, proposal. Okay, which means that what we, when we, in our investigation, when we came across the fact that the, the wife of the president has an account in the central bank. By the way, we're talking about two accounts: one account at the central bank, and another account in a secondary government bank, the local commercial bank, where money from the Consolidated Revenue Fund is being given, is allocated to the First Lady for the conduct of our activities. That was mind blowing because it's illegal. It's that we checked the budgetary estimates in Parliament and we found nowhere where in the budgetary estimate where Parliament approved the use of such money. And besides the Office of the First Lady is not even a state institution. The wife of the president is just a wife of a president. The Office of the First Lady is a private organization. It has no right to access uh, public money directly. But in this case, we found out that for the first time in the history of Sierra Leone, and we looked at the bank record for the last 30 years, and we have that, we've challenged government, that on June 28, we had the first time where the office, where the wife of the president, an account was opened at the central bank, and 2.98 billion, I mean, Leones was given as a first um, allocation to open the account. And subsequent to that, in six months, we found out that um, about 8 billion uh, leons, which is $800,000, uh, um, $800, has been given to the office of the First Lady at the central bank account alone. The second bank account, which is held by the local commercial bank, details of which we have not even published yet, um, also has a, at least twice that amount. Some of it is directly from the Consolidated Revenue Fund. Other parts of that account also holds monies that came from um, uh, private organizations. This could be government agencies, departments, uh, more, but more so telecommunication companies um, that are operating in the country. They give contributions and uh, NGOs. So that account we've not even mentioned. We've not published the details of the local commercial bank. So these are two government accounts. These are two accounts set up for the very first time in June and in July. The one at the central bank was set up in June, one month after the Madhavi administration came to, came, you know, was inaugurated. So we we found out that for the, for the first six months of the bill administration, the first lady, the wife of the president received more money, sometimes seven times more than uh, even the Ministry of uh, Information, the Ministry of Social Welfare, Agenda and Children's Affairs, even the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Foreign Affairs. We've highlighted this. So now um, that's illegal first. In the first place, 
there was no parliamentary approval for the. So how does that make it? How does that make it illegal? Because Parliament is not aware. It's not only illegal; it's hidden. It was a hidden public expenditure, and it's hidden because it was done secretly with the knowledge of the presidency, with the knowledge of the minister of finance and the accountant general's department and the bank governor. These were the only people who were aware of this until we uh, brought the details out to the public. Parliamentarians were not aware. You must remember that Parliament, the opposition in Parliament, I think it was the NGC um, leadership and the APC leadership in Parliament wrote a letter, sent a letter to the Ministry of Finance and the, minister and the bank governor asking for explanation uh, to clarify whether actually these allocations that have been reported by the uh, African Express were exactly the case. Why would they say that? Because they were not aware that these things have been done and government hasn't got the right to use money without parliamentary approval. You can even take the case of the United States where um, they wanted to give you know, stimulus packages to, to citizens and they could not do that without the approval of Congress. So everywhere in the world, that's how governments are structured. The executive okay. branch of government cannot use public money in any fashion without the approval of parliament. Now, the Ministry of Finance has come out, uh, I think two weeks ago, accepting. Initially, they denied, on, you know, and then they could not deny the evidence. And then they accepted that they are authorized under the laws of Sierra Leone to use 1% of, you know, on non-budgetary allocations. But that's not a non-budgetary allocation because when you compute the amount of money that was given to the, what you call the office of the first lady, the wife of the president, which is an illegal public funding, is more than seven times sometimes uh, seven times more than what other ministries, government ministries and agencies that are supposed to receive government money did not receive. So that's one aspect, the illegal nature of the allocation. Now, we can examine the second aspect of the, of the question, which is the use of the funds. In the first place, if the, if, the first, if, the, if the wife of the president hasn't got right to have direct access of the allocation, it means it's illegal. So you cannot even justify its use by saying it was used for the intended purpose because the president himself has said the wife used the money for the intended purpose. And we have said it's, it's, it's incorrect because when you look at, we've published the entire bank statement of the office of the first lady showing exactly how the monies were used. For example, the, of, the wife of the president herself did say that um, when the evidence is now presented, she said she used the money to invite guests to furnish her office and all of that. And we have shown that even if you take the, the question of furnishing the office of the first lady, um, you cannot explain how you can spend seven hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars in buying furniture. We've shown that it's not. This is not made up by the African Express. It is basically um, from the record, from the from the financial record of the office of the first lady. So, on the one side, you have the Ill, the illegality of the allocation, and on the second part of it, the unjustifiable use of the funds. The funds are not used according to the Public Finance Management Act. There's law that governs how you use public money. If you have the right, for example, to receive public money and you want to do um, procurement, there are rules governing procurement. There are rules governing cash withdrawals. If you, check, if you calculate the cash withdrawals alone, um, you will see the illegality behind all of this. So it was illegal to give the, the wife of the president such amount of money, public money. And secondly, the money was not also used for the intended purpose. They have said they used it for the intended purpose, but they haven't shown you the evidence of that. We have shown you the evidence of the use. But um, this, we are still on the elementary phases. Let me just emphasize um, that we are still on the elementary phase of this uh, conversation, the elementary phase of the publication, which we have only established that X amount of funds we are giving to the wife of the president, which is illegal, and that the money, the monies were not used um, for, their, for what they call the intended purpose. All okay. right, let's get. So they have been denied. They haven't denied any of the evidence. They have only uh, tried to say that it is normal. They have argued that this was done in the past. And we okay, have... let us get to your publication on Chief Minister. Like I said, we are getting into the specifics of these people that you mentioned basically on your publications. And I want to give you the opportunity because Cerulinians are watching and listening to you so that you can elaborate and explain to Sierra Leoneans how what makes these uh, monies illegal and what is the financial crime or what is what are the consequences of doing such a thing. So let's get into the specifics of the chief minister. Yes, um, the chief minister's uh, uh, 
what we've reported on the chief minister's office has multiple layers in itself. If, if people will take the report and, and examine it. Uh, in the first place, we talked about um, the fact that over 30 billion euros, which is more than $3 million, have been used by the office of the chief minister, mostly 80% of which is mostly on issues of procurement that did not comply with the regulations. Okay, so they haven't denied that. What they have said, they've came up, they came up, they've accepted that that is the case. They've accepted that the allocation is the case. The argument from the chief minister's office is that that is the normal way of doing business. In fact, they haven't denied the fact that the, the procurements happened contrary to um, the procurement rules and regulations of the country, which is that you cannot, for example, that we showed evidence of uh, uh, three vehicles that were procured from Salman Motors without um, a public tender, without an advertisement, and that is contrary to the rules. That's we are talking about close to three, bi three billion leons, more than three hundred thousand dollars, which is outside of the rules. What they have said is that they had a pre um, a blanket. Uh, authorization that the National Public Procurement Authority gave them the right to procure without without following the rules. And they presented a supposed letter from the NPPA, the National Public Procurement Authority, uh, that was dated in July, which I will tell you the people now that are listening, including anyone from government, that the letter in itself is a, is a, is a fake document in the sense that the first allocation that went to the office of the first at the office of the chief minister happened in August. It was a late August, I think August 26 was the first time that the first allocation was moved from the from the CRF into the account of the chief minister. And that account, by the way, was the account that was being, that was operated by what was before then the um, uh, chief of staff. So when the Bureau administration took office and they named a chief minister, David Francis, David Francis took over the account and then ran the same account. But then by August 26, the transaction details show that it was being run by what they call the Office of the Chief Minister. So it's the same account. It was the first time, the first time that the allocation was given from the central bank or the CRF to the Chief Minister's office was on June, on, on August 26. <clears throat> so the, if you are arguing that you had a pre um, authorization from the NPPA to carry out procurement, you know without following the procurement rules, then how can the PPA give authorization in July before the allocation? So it doesn't make sense. You cannot authorize somebody to buy uh, something when the individual has not received even the allocation in the first place. So in their, in their effort to justify the illegality, they also added on, and, uh, you know, surreptitious, it's a criminal effort to uh, justify illegality. But let me come to the specifics of the, of the irregularity in this, in this case. We've talked about the procurement of three Prado vehicles. We also discovered that the said Prado, vehicle, Prado vehicles that were procured for DSTI, there was no evidence that all of the vehicles were even supplied by the, by the, by the vendor, by Salma Motors. Up to now, the government has not disproved that, 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 that uh, aspect of the report. Secondly, we also showed that 10 uh, billion, which is $1 million in cash withdrawals by one individual alone, Siddiqui Jabi mostly. Um, and these, the interesting part is that these cash withdrawals, voluminous cash withdrawals, that also did not comply with the uh, withdrawal regulations and the banks, the, the banking regulations regarding amount of cash that should be withdrawn, the, the size of the withdrawals, and all of that. Most of these withdrawals, when you check the dates, we publish all these uh, serial, the serials of all the transaction details. When you check right. when you check the transaction details and the dates of the transaction, you will find out that many of these transactions happened on Friday or Thursday, a day before the weekend. So the question is, why will you withdraw 200 million, 300 million on a weekend? What is government doing with that? And all of these cash withdrawals, there are no justifications for their use. Why would one individual be doing this? When you aggregate the amount of cash withdrawals from the chief minister's office to the office of the first lady, the office of the president, what you will have is close to um, 90 billion, what we are talking about, 90 billion, if you aggregate all these totals. It's so scary an amount to see how government, they, they are, we've shown in detail, bit by bit, how these monies have been used, for example, 200 million in the purchase of coffee. You know, all of these procurements did not happen according to the ways public finances are supposed to be used. By the way, nobody is saying government should not use money. We are basically saying the waste, what we are highlighting is the uh, waste in public spending, 
the violation of procedures in terms of how money should be spent and the lack of justification for the use of these funds. Okay, government has not been able to say otherwise. They have only insulted us by saying that um, this is how governments have been running. This that um, the president himself said one million to use one million dollars is nothing for him in 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 in, in traveling. Yeah, so I, 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 want, I want us to get into that. I want us to get, uh, when you mentioned the $1 million, I want us to get into that. In 2000, last year, 2020, the whole world was faced with a health, uh, an health crisis, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And in the same 2020, last year, our president and the first lady, went to Lebanon for vacation. And according to your publication or your investigation, that a sum of $1 million was used single-handedly by the president uh, for vacation purposes. Can you please get into the specifics also of those details? That is, that is perhaps one of the most um, uh, interesting evidence we've published so far, which people, I think, uh, need to re-examine again. Um, in, in August, we were all aware that um, the president left the country in the middle of the uh, pandemic and went to Lebanon. And this was a period when Lebanon was also in, in crisis. They've just had, um, um, I think, the earthquake or something like that. The, we discovered that um, for the first time in 30 years, looking at the bank records as well, in 30 years of um, government operations, financial operations in Sierra Leone, this is the first time we've seen in the, in the records. Um, on a single day, in, in one transaction alone, the president withdrawing over $400,000 cash. This, is, this, this was mind blowing to look at. The president took along with him, apart from the other transactions, the payment, the wire transfers that went out to a supposed um, airline company, Davis and Dan, which is a different story by itself. This, this, the first leg of this story is mind blowing in the sense that we've seen the president taking $410,000, loading it on a private plane that he hired uh, or he supposedly hired and then went to uh, Lebanon with it. And a couple of weeks later, we saw again the, uh, the wife of the president coming into the country and withdrawing cash, um, more than $60,000, again, to in the name of, um, you know, supposedly paying for medical bills for the president. But then a state house communication regarding that uh, uh, trip had already said that the president was going on a private uh, uh, visit. And that private visit, along, during that private visit, he's expected to conduct or strengthen the bilateral relations between Lebanon and, and, and Sierra Leone. And then we discovered that on the, on, the, on the official record, the president stated that he was going on a medical trip and that the $410,000 he, he took out of the bank before leaving was basically going to be used to pay his medical bills. And we have examined um, his activities in uh, uh, Lebanon while he was there. And this is also supported by photographs and, and uh, public statements made by his wife. And also, if you remember, the BBC interviewed the Minister of uh, Information at the time regarding the president's visit. They all said he was on a vacation. He needed rest. His wife said he was on a honeymoon. Okay, we've discovered that if he was going on a honeymoon, why would the president state on the record that he was going on a medical trip? And why would he need a million dollars? So in totality, they spent over a million dollars. They took over a million dollars from the Bank of Sierra Leone when you know for that Lebanon trip alone, and not, and the president came back on his return, they deposited um, twelve thousand dollars into the bank as the remaining balance from the more than four hundred thousand dollars that he took cash. This is exclusive of you know the several hundreds of thousands of dollars that they've paid um, as supposedly to hire the flight to Lebanon and back. Okay, and. Uh, this is also exclusive of the additional more than sixty thousand dollars that was taken again a few weeks later by his wife, um, on 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 a second visit while the president was still in Lebanon. 
So we've shown this. The government hasn't denied it. The president has decided to, to defend um, this irregularity and this unexplained use of public funds because up to now, the people of Sierra Leone are deprived of understanding exactly what was the basis of that uh, visit, whether it was for a private visit, for a honeymoon, or for a medical care. And if it was for a medical care, how much did that medical trip cost the people of Sierra Leone? How much was paid? Which hospital? And how much? So we are still, there is a second aspect of this story regarding the nature of the visit in Lebanon itself and other components of it, which we intend to publish as we move along. But for this first uh, publication, there are several questions. One, we've said nobody has ever withdrawn in the last 30 years as president more than 400, about $400,000 cash on a single transaction. We've also still, the people of Sierra Leone are deprived of a genuine explanation regarding that particular trip. Why did the president go to Lebanon? And the official record shows something different from what State House announced to the public regarding the president's visit. We've shown that they haven't denied. I've seen explanation in fact, uh, very recently, the minister, the deputy minister of internal affairs was on, was on one of the radio stations in which we heard him say that the president was on a medical trip, but they never said, talked about a medical trip until the African Express uh, published the details. So um, there are several components. The president's wife hasn't got any right to withdraw money from the central bank on behalf of the president. That's one aspect of illegality. The second aspect is what happened to the, to this mo to the money? What was the purpose of the trip? So these are not basically, these are not allegations. These are basically um, what we call the, the complete um, ex re revealing well, the ex conduct of government. And they haven't denied well, that they use this one million, more than one million dollars. But the, but the, pres but the president um, uh, in, in one of the, uh, his media talk mentioned that um, all, all those publications and everything is talk, talk, talk. And where is the evidence? What more evidence do does Africanist press need to bring out for the anti-corruption to act? Because like I said, the president in one of his media tours say, it's just mere talk. There is no evidence. Bring the evidence. Well, um, <laughs> I, in the history, I will answer that question by saying that in the history of African journalism, um, from what we know, um, there is only one individual who has gotten close to what we have done and was unable to finish. And that's an inspiration to what we do in the, in the African, especially for this uh, investigative project. I'm reminded of Carlos Cardoso, who is a personal mentor and friend from Mozambique, who actually investigated the privatization of the Mozambican Central Bank. And we, he was talking about investigating how uh, the president and his family and close allies have uh, profited from a $15 million transaction dealing with the privatization of the bank. So he published only three articles and not even close to the evidence we're talking about. So basically, I do not think we have had a situation, and this might be self-trumpeting uh, one's own work, but when we look across the African uh, media landscape, I think we are confronted with a situation that is very serious in the sense that um, the DNA of a government's operation is being presented in front of the people. And it's so heart rendering to see leaders trying to trivialize uh, the significance of this kind of uh, uh, work because citizens, public money is not a private, um, it's not a private property of politicians in power. Public funds are basically the property of the citizens. And every individual has the right as a citizen to demand explanation regarding the use of uh, public money. Governments are not doing people favor by uh, using the president. The, none of the people in government have denied um, the fact that, for example, the president used any of the money we've, we've, we've reported. So you take the case of the first lady, it's an illegal situation, it's unprecedented in the history of Sierra Leone to have a first lady the wife of a president operating in that fashion, having more money than ministries. This, this has never happened. And I do, I'm not aware of that kind of situation in other parts of the African continent. We talk about uh, the flamboyant lifestyle of African first ladies from, Pat Patrick will, correct, will say more about this, in Kenya, the Lucy Kibaki, yeah. mm -hmm. the Grace Mugabe's, and uh, um, uh, 
in Cameroon and all of that. But we've never had a situation that I am aware of where the wife of a president has more money, budgetary allocation, more than ministries. I mean, this it cannot be explained in the Sierra Leone context and it doesn't make sense in other parts of um, the, so the, the government of Sierra Leone, what I'm trying to say, owes the people of Sierra Leone an explanation regarding the use of these monies that we're talking about. We are not saying government cannot use money. Frivolous use of public spending cannot be trivialized. Uh, the there is no more evidence that can be presented. It would have been a different case if the government has denied that the bank statements we've published are not genuine, they are not correct. But they haven't denied this evidence. They are only trying to say it is not evidentiary enough. <laughs> so uh, how much more evidence? So, 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 why, so why do you think um, the anti-corruption, uh, you know, has not come out to investigate these publications as well? Well, I, I, I think um, we have said uh, corruption is a dynamic organism. Corruption is not just uh, in the past tense. Corruption is, is, is a living situation. It lives with human beings. It's, it's a is an ongoing process. So we are interested in fighting we fighting corruption in its present continuous form. And so what the Africanist press publications did, uh, we have been doing this for a year now, focusing on Sierra Leone. The first part of our uh, effort was to show that there was pervasive corruption in the administration, which by December, we had already established that fact. Beginning in March to December of 2020, we showed that fact and highlighting exactly the evasion of taxes by a company owned by the president, owned by agents of the president, given a monopoly license in a free market economy to a friend of the president who is a member of the SLPP and was a member of the president's finance committee. And we're talking about the country of Sierra Leone losing over $5 billion in potential revenue. They are, they are excusing that kind of expense. So in the second phase, beginning January to this April, what we've done is to show the pattern and the manifestations of that corruption and the characters, the protagonists of that corruption, the individuals who are involved in that corruption, and they include the president, his wife, his chief minister, and key people. We've also highlighted in other departments how this corruption plays out. And if you see, when you look at the audit report, there is this key statement in the 2019 report where they say revenues collected by the NRA or the National Minerals Agency or all these agencies are not being banked. They're not taking them to the central bank. Why? Because many of those monies are either paid to the president's bank account, his foundation bank account, or they know that. So the Anti-Corruption Commission is unable to undertake this uh, kind of operation because, <laughs> of course, um, this is a test to them. This is an opportunity to test the independence right. of the commission. And I have said, we've had two commissioners in the history of the, of the anti-corruption effort in Sierra that I will um, highlight as examples of effort to fight corruption genuinely. Val Collier came up against named key ministers in the Tijan Kaba administration. And by 2005, the entire government ran him out of the Anti-Corruption Commission because they were no longer committed because he was talking about corruption within the Kaba administration. By then I was editor of Concord Times. I followed that story up to the point when he was invited to parliament. He was so frustrated that he said parliamentarians are sick men in clutches. Second, Abdul Tijan Cole, we all know how he left the Anti-Corruption Commission. So the current corrupt commissioner has an opportunity to show the people of Sierra Leone whether he's on the side of government or he is committed to fighting to protect the government. So far, there has been a concerted effort on the part of the state and its media agents and people in their civil society, including its, its various components, anti-corruption implicated in this case, to, to cover up these corruption stories that we are publishing. Okay, but, uh, let me go to- The president go to has come out and said, there's no corruption relating to his wife and all of that. So how will the anti-corruption be able to investigate when the Ministry of Finance and the, and the president himself has already vindicated his wife, even though the anti-corruption commission- All right, let me go to, let me go to. All right, thank you very much, uh, um, Chair Noba. So far, like I just said, we are giving you the opportunity to go into details with some of these publications and I want to encourage Sierra Leoneans or uh, viewers that are watching to please continue to share the video. I want to go to you, Dr. Wallis. Dr. Wallis is um, the um, director of publications, African Express. Um, Dr. Wallis, in one of the, like we just mentioned about the president using about a billion dollar just for a trip of vacation to Lebanon. Why is it important to look at presidential travel expenditure 
when one investigates issues on transparency and accountability? And why is the overseas personal spending of the president of Sierra Leone important to African Express investigation, taking into consideration the economic situation in the country? Yeah, that's a great question. So the um, issue really is um, how much money is being spent, which is an outrageous amount. Um, the fact that this is the money belongs to the people of Sierra Leone. And right now, um, more than 60% of citizens in Sierra Leone live on less than $1.25 a day. So that's extreme poverty. And when you think about how that relates to health issues, so Sierra Leone has a very, very high infant mortality rate. So over 80 infants in their first year of life die per 1,000 live births. Women die at a very, very high rate during pregnancy, labor and delivery, and postpartum. Um, hospitals are in very poor shape. And then to have a president go spend a million dollars on a so-called vacation brings up a lot of questions of ethics. And to bring, um, I guess to hone the point is that think how much even that $1 million, which is a lot, could do to improve the health of the people of Sierra Leone, to reduce poverty so that people can live long, healthy lives. When their own money is being taken and misused and abused by the president and the first lady. And I think it's um, the, the investigative work that the Africanist press mainly, um, largely Chernoba and his staff have been doing is, is phenomenal to um, uncover exactly where all this money that belongs to the people of Sierra Leone is going. Okay, um, let me go to Patrick. Um, we see how important, like you said, it is for transparency and uh, accountability when it comes to those issues. Patrick, let me ask you something as an associate editor of the African Express. And you are familiar with corruption investigation, especially in Kenya, where you come from. What would you say about the African Express reports on corruption in Sierra Leone? Do you find any relationship uh, between corruption, crimes in Sierra Leone and Kenya or other parts of, African, of the African continent? that you are familiar with? Um, thank you very much for that wonderful question. And uh, first, I would um, like to say that um, the work that Africanist Press has done is bold, daring, and very timely. It is a kind of work that has become rare to find in a shrinking world of activists in the entire continent. Uh, this has been very rare indeed. And in many African countries, questioning what the office of the president does is almost considered a treasonable act. Mm -hmm. And I think many uh, people have suffered by doing that. And with the shrinking human rights spaces, uh, there are threats and manipulations. The office of the president has become even more opaque and difficult to hold to account. Um, critically looking at the comments, uh, the debates and the arguments that the reports uh, from African East Press have generated, you come to realization that the public is demanding for more accountability and transparency from their leaders. More than that, you realize that um, the longing desire of, for a different kind of governance and a government that puts its people and not the leaders first. And usually what happens in what we are seeing is that we have politicians uh, appropriating the space of economic space and social space that um, makes the citizen really a yearn for you know, recognition. They, they, they are deprived of their rights. Uh, they are deprived of many other social amenities. And secondly, with many African countries reeling under economic constraints, the African report uh, shows how millions of public money is lost due to deep-rooted corruption. 
In Kenya, for example, I would say that it is estimated that the value of government funds stolen through corrupt deals uh, by state officers amounts to about 140 billion shillings or uh, about 1.4 billion annually. And that is really huge. That's money that can do a lot of things. And this is a report that has been done by the director of public prosecution in Kenya itself. So you realize the amount of resources that are being wasted. Uh, most recently, if we talk about the pandemic, uh, in the sixth month of the pandemic in Kenya, an estimated $400 million were lost uh, uh, and money disappeared in terms of supplies and entrepreneurship. And I want to say that uh, what is brilliant in the African Express reports is to choose to focus on expenditures by the first family, an area that would ordinarily be ignored. Uh, many people really wouldn't focus into that. But I want to say, what does this show you? What does it show us? It shows that the office of the president, not only in Sierra Leone, but many countries, including Kenya, where I come from, has become smarter in finding ways to escape the public gaze on its expenditures because, you know, who would be thinking of money going through um, you know, the, the first lady, you know, those kind of things. Uh, in, in a situation where most of the corruption cases are, you know, focusing on mundane things like, um, you know, focusing on things like um, infrastructure where entrepreneurship has become an issue, forgetting that there is other avenue of presidential travels that would uh, you know, siphon money from the public. And this is the brilliant focus that African Express is bringing into the picture. Uh, during Charles Barr's um, uh, explanation, he actually alluded to what is happening in Kenya where you find the first lady having a huge chunk of money directed to projects. And when you follow these projects critically, they either never in existence or just a small percentage of that exists. Um, yeah. All right. Um, yeah, we can clearly see that um, corruption in Africa, they are all similar in a different, you know, in, in, in a way. And I like the fact that you said the first family is being focused because of the situation that we have in Africa, and especially Sierra Leone, looking at the economic, you know, situation in Sierra Leone, for those monies to be spent by just the first family is very outrageous. Um, I want to go to, to Cherno. Cherno, um, how authentic um, are these publications? How authentic are these publications on, on financial crime against President Bio, especially for some Sierra Leoneans who are questioning the authenticity of African Express? Well, I, I will, um, I think to answer that question, let me explain how we verify evidence in the first place. Uh, when it comes to um, the work that we do. Um, we have a simple method of triangulation. I, I have alluded to this in the past, in which we, when it comes to um, investigations of this nature, because of the high profile nature of the characters or the individuals we're dealing with, we ensure that the evidence must be, must be strictly primary. That is to say, it has to come from the sources themselves. It has to come from evidence generated by the activities of the individual or the institution itself. That includes incontrovertible documentary evidence by way of correspondences, uh, letters, and um, in this case, bank statements. You know, <laughs> like I said, um, one individual I know who is a close friend and mentor of mine, Carlos Cardoso says when you are dealing with the finance of the government, there is nothing you can go beyond the bank statement because the bank statement is the equivalent of the lab result of a, of a patient. When you take the patient for, uh, into a lab and then you do a comprehensive laboratory um, run of the patient, it will tell you a different thing, the DNA of the patient, the uh, blood group of the patient, what kind of disease 
uh, that the patient has. So that's what the bank statement gives you. It gives you a complete um, window into the, into the kind of operation of, of a government. That's one aspect. But there is also accompanying everywhere. And sure that, for example, when we say the president has wired money um, to Davis and Dan, we track Davis and Dan. We track the, the wire transaction code because the, the transaction code in itself, the SWIFT code is a language by itself. If you, if you, if you are able to just work with the, with the SWIFT code, it will lead you, it will generate a whole transnational kind of operation where the money went, where it landed, and perhaps what happened to that money. For example, when you check the bank statement of the office of the first lady, you will see that over $700,000 was given to AA Enterprises in Freetown in the name of furniture. So the question for us will not just be um, whether the furniture was purchased or not. The question is why will just the first lady pay this money to this single uh, company? And then we will also investigate that particular company to see what kind of operations is financial operation. So if you, are, if you check all those financial codes and transactions, you might find some of that money went outside and also, so you can trace the triangle. So basically what I'm saying is that none of the uh, publications were published, or all of the publications were published, are uh, supported by documentary, primary documentary evidence, including bank statements, letters. When we talk about payroll, we, we will give you the entire payroll. And all of these government officials who have spoken at one time or another have never denied the bank statements. They've never denied the evidence we presented. What they are saying is that this is, to them is normal. They say that's a normal way. It's, it, that's so, a normal. But yes. they're also yeah. saying the, 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 the due process was followed. Yeah, that's what, they, that's, what they, that's what they are trying to argue. They are arguing that the due, due process, but in this case, what, how can you justify um, if due process, let's take the case of the first lady as an example. Why would parliament decide to question the minister of finance and the bank governor to explain whether these actual transactions happened because parliament wasn't aware of them. So if parliament was aware of them, why would parliament pretend that they are not aware? If parliament is not aware, then it's illegal. And let's go back. The first lady herself denied or has been saying she was not using public money on any of our activities until the African Express published the details. So all of these government officials who are coming out now, pretending that what, what have been reported is, is, is normal, never um, talked about, for example, the office of the first lady receiving money. They, they supported the, the denial of the first lady until the evidence came out that they can deny. So what I'm saying is for us, um, it's not the denial of the state, it's basically, the people of Sierra Leone is upon them now to decide what they want to do with this evidence. The parliament, they can ask their parliament to investigate. Parliament made, did show perhaps an attempt to investigate. Let's follow up on that and see what uh, the Anti-Corruption Commission uh, promised the people an investigation. The president has come out and said his wife and all of the people we've reported on, including himself, haven't done anything wrong. They haven't waited. They should have waited for the Anti-Corruption Commission to investigate. Now they have uh, tampered with the investigation. Basically, they are preventing the Anti-Corruption from arriving at, a, at a, uh, some kind of conclusion, reasonable conclusion or, or genuine conclusion of the, they cannot move forward with the investigation anymore. In fact, Anti-Corruption was itself on record to, to defend uh, the, the state against these uh, re revealing evidence of, of, of corruption. So, but- okay. For me and for the team, I think this is just the preliminary phase, what I want to emphasize, the preliminary phase of the, of, the, of the investigation or the reports, which is to show the pervasive nature of this pattern of graft. Patrick alluded to the mechanics of corruption, because we always think of corruption as somebody uh, diverting contract money or stuff like that, infrastructure and things like that. Chairman, we before not, I go to- We do not think about the innovative mechanisms used by states and agencies of the state. All right, before I go to Dr. Barry, before I go to Dr. Barry, can you give us a clue um, of how this money or the location of this money outside Sierra Leone, how, where this money goes to out of Sierra Leone? Can you give us a clue? Yeah, I, I, I think um, uh, Professor Wallace um, did mention the, the, um, 
the ethical aspect of it in the first place, the use of $1 million by the president to Lebanon. If you take, for example, very recently we talked about, the president mentioned that he's traveling to repair the image of the country, okay? Which is a question of ethics. And then he said um, he went to Japan and he was kicked out of a hotel simply because there was a previous debt. We all know this, how somebody would check into a hotel or not, but this is the thing. We showed evidence again to show that that is not just false because why, why would we decide to disprove that or to challenge the president's statement is because he was using that as a basis to rationalize this exorbitant uh, expenditure, this illegal use of, of travel money or illegal or the use of travel to divert money from the central bank to his own private uh, 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 means. Because the president is saying if he's traveling, the state should be responsible for his travel, yes, but why will you be traveling all this and taking these huge amounts of money? For example, for, for the Japan trip, the president went to Japan on a TICAD conference, okay? The Tokyo International Conference on African Development, which is an international event. And the protocol for that event has already been arranged by the host, host government. But he took along with him $270,000 and came back, him and his wife. He, he, the president alone had for himself $91,000, more than $91,000 as his per diem. His wife took close to $37,000 as per diem. And they are both, the two of them will be sleeping in the same room, occupying the same hotel uh, um, during that trip. So how will you justify the use of that seven, this separate per diems taken by each one of them? So that, that raises the question. So then if they took um, between the two of them more than $120,000 and they came back, they did not retire any remaining balance, the question is, if that money was not used, you cannot use that in, in five days. If it wasn't used completely in uh, Japan, then where is the money? It means the money is somewhere else. So that is the second phase of our work, which is why we are saying, I, we keep reminding people that the work of the African Express has already started. And this is the first phase of the work, which is to show. So there is more, in other words, there is more it, to come. That's what I'm laying out to you, that the parts to the investigation, the first effort was to show that there was pervasive corruption. And now the second phase is to show the mechanics, the patterns of this corruption through travel per diem, through cash, massive cash withdrawals, through illegal allocation of public funds, through um, irregular procurement uh, methods. And, and these mechanisms, these are basically, is, is a legalized method of stealing public money with the use of the existing legislations and infrastructure of the state. So people do not see okay. it because they think it's normal, it's legal, but it's an effort to use the loopholes or to use legal means to steal, use legal means to steal, to use a, uh, what's in the can call Pancreo book for, for thief. So they use the mechanics of the state, the operational mechanics of the state to divert public money into their own ends. So if we aggregate, we are talking about in 2020 alone, $3 million that the president cannot account for on travel alone. And the 2019 evidence is worse than 2020. The 2018, the first six months is worse than 2019, I will tell you. So this is, this is basically, and we are not making this up. We are basically reproducing what has been generated by the activities of these characters in governance. We are basically showing the public how evidence of what these individuals have done. And these individuals have not denied that what we have said is anything that is not what they have done. They are saying, this is the way things are done. So the question people should ask them is, you promised us a new direction. You promised to uh, reduce international travel. If this is legal, why would the president and his finance minister decide to bring in a law in parliament in 2020 to, make, to say that they should not be uh, held to account for monies used on travel is because the president was now right. yeah. okay. let me quickly go to, to let me quickly go to let me quickly go to um uh, dr barry because i think um he might be leaving shortly to break his um uh, fast dr barry uh you can agree with me that corruption is um a deterrent to development in every country or in any country but as the head of human rights commission in the gambia how does corruption affect the human right of uh, a citizen? Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. Um, uh, first of all, I think we should first establish that uh, corruption by nature is very difficult to define. And if you look at it from the context of Africa in general, 
um, the concept of corruption uh, it is very, very difficult to situate. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm dissociating. I'm, I'm not, for example, in the case of Charaba, he is looking at the state machinery here um, that is misusing public funds. That aspect of corruption is one of many other forms of corruption. There are other forms of corruption, for example, that could be associated with bribery. Others would, that is the most common anyway. And then there is the other one that has to do with patronage, because patronage is part of corruption, where uh, institutions, enterprises, uh, companies would, uh, you know, give gifts or provide support to governments um, in exchange for those kind of particular services where they will have to break procurement uh, regulations, et cetera, et cetera. So, so corruption in public office is, is a very complex one. Now, but then let's come to the specificities with regard to West Africa here. Uh, the similarities here in general is that people do not see corruption in certain aspects as corruption. Uh, I think basically it's because people don't understand its definition. And uh, let's say, for example, um, if, we, if, if a country is endemic in the way they, they exercise corruption and it becomes like a natural thing to do, the people who suffer most are the ones who are poor who are unable to, to, you know, to, to, to corrupt officials to get what they want. And because of corruption, what will happen eventually is that is what we call um, uh, access to justice, which is limited, or let's say fair trials that are unfortunately not possible. Let me give you an example. Some powerful people can involve themselves into corruption. What will happen? Now, let's say that they are caught. It will be easy for them to bribe their way out very easily uh, because they know in the context in which we are, because people have not um, got, uh, let's say, um, a, a very good income, um, so they can easily offer uh, some very appealing and uh, appetizing or exciting uh, packages to them. You know, it could be a house uh, in Europe, for example, it could be a beautiful car, uh, it could be a big envelope, a, a big uh, briefcase full of dollars. So eventually they can get their way because it is easy to give a public officer who is not earning much uh, a huge amount of money to either keep quiet, change the papers, or even shut their eyes when wrong is being done, or if it is judicial, the judicial, uh, the judiciary, for example, for them to make out justice in their favor. So that means the people who suffer most is the majority, because the majority cannot afford to do that. And as a result, their rights are violated. And this is where the human rights violation comes in. Their rights become violated. Um, but in the context of what Charno is explaining here, if it is states misusing public funds, or the rights that are violated is, is, is much more general. It's, it's a national, uh, you know, it's a national cry. Because what it means that misappropriation of funds would, would drive those funds away from the kinds of projects that could have benefited the poor people. It could, be, it could be projects that have to do with good roads. It could be projects that have to do with hospitals. It could be projects that have to do with medication. Because the poor ones can't afford to travel across countries to go and get Medicare elsewhere. They can't afford um, to travel in, on bad roads when they have perishable goods to go and sell. They can't afford um, when they are sick uh, to travel distances to go to hospitals. They might have to do that on very poor roads, but a very poor um, um, ways of, uh, of traveling, like on a, motor, on a donkey cart or something like that, when they could have good roads and good cars accessing them or good public transportation. So these kinds of facilities are what we call public's rights to, um, you know, to, to basic rights to their li lives. You know, when they talk about basic rights, that's, how, that's what it means. They have the basic rights of having good education, of, of good water, uh, of, of good roads, et cetera, et cetera, so that they can also engage themselves into a meaningful employment so that they can, they can have pursuit of happiness. But once corruption is endemic in a country, what it does, it stifles all those efforts. Then the money is diverted okay personal needs or personal uh, use. As a result, it will deplete the coffers. Eventually, it will create a cri economic crisis. Uh, the poor will suffer more. Their rights would be, would, would, would be in the balance. And uh, naturally, what states would do in that regard, they would eventually have to put in draconian regulations to stifle uh, silence so that people don't have to speak. Because if the press wants to criticize them, they'll find a way of stifling the press. If they have civil society that is criticizing them, they will do every means to make sure that those people are, are silenced. Either they are killed or they are sent out of the country into exile. So this is what most of the states will do if they are really involved into corruption. 
Okay, I think um, you've laid the foundation clearly for us to understand how corruption affects our human rights. And I'm sure um, Sierraleans are getting to understand some of these things that we are not just speaking for speaking sake. These are things directly and indirectly affecting uh, the citizen of a country. Before I leave you, Dr. Barry, let me ask you this because you are the head of the Human Rights Commission in the Gambia. For the past three years, the BO administration um, in Sierra Leone, uh, during the BO administration in Sierra Leone for the past three years, Sierra Leone has, has witnessed consistent episodes of violence involving police brutality and killings across um, many parts of the country. For instance, in April last year, police killed unarmed prisoners at the central prison in Freetown and a few others some, some, um, across Sierra Leone. In a situation like this, what if it occurs in the Gambia and as someone working on human rights, what will be your approach to this issue of police violence, especially the killing of unarmed civilians? Thank you very much. Uh, I think the first thing we should establish is that um, the states is the duty bearer when it comes to the uh, fulfillment and protection of the rights of every individual within the jurisdiction of their power, meaning within the country in which the state governs. And when we talk about the states, we should first of all understand that these are the three branches of government, the judiciary, the executive, the legislative. At the same time, all other state agencies. And here in particular, we're talking of the security, security services. Now, they are responsible for the fulfillment and protection of the rights of individuals. And here, when we talk about security services, we can elaborate for more. We're talking of the police, but there is the army, there is the immigration, there is the Gambia, uh, I mean, sorry, the prison, prison department, um, and, and then there is the National Guard, etc. So if these people follow due process, if they follow what is required in the, in the regulations, in their constitutions, where everybody's rights are protected, then normally due process will require them the respect of everybody's right. Even one that is said to be, uh, a, a, how do they call it, accused. Because remember, an accusation is just a presumption of guilt, that the person is innocent until the person is proven guilty. And that can only be established in the proper court of law when all evidences point out to the person being guilty. So we cannot assume that somebody is guilty upfront. Why, even if, if, I mean, even if the person has been still in the market and has been caught red-handed, normally even that person, even where everybody knows the person is guilty, the right thing to do is to hand him over to the proper authorities and he will go through due process and would never be prosecuted and then would face the sentence that is deserving of the crime. So it will be wrong today to assume that one can take the law in their hands. And naturally, where you have a state or a government or an executive that needs, that wants to stifle full silence, for example, or that wants to ensure that people are afraid, to people who unfortunately are ignorant of their rights. Because I like, let me say this, unfortunately, a lot of uh, uh, West Africans or Africans in general do not know what their basic rights are. They will be, you will be surprised that when you make a survey, most of them would even tell you that human rights is a foreign concept. It is not a national concept. You don't understand what that means. So first of all, let them understand that the right is there. So if a police brutality occurs, the nature of the brutality if assessed, and it turns out that it was indispensable for the police to use arms, then maybe that assessment would get to a court and the court would establish that it was a way of self-defense. However, if it, was, if it is, uh, a so black... who police? Who, who is who is policing the police in this situation? Well, in that case, in the case that we are talking about, naturally, it, it should be a, a, an, an institution like the Human Rights Commission, normally, because this should this would be the independent, um, impartial authority or established authority that should be able to to ensure that the rights of every individual is protected. Now, if somebody is um, mishandled by a police let's say, for example, and they report to the commission, what can happen eventually is that the commission can take up a task force or a panel, investigate it, and if they find that the person has is right, because the, the human rights commissions can have also what we call 
uh, a court authority, a high court authority. In the case of the Gambia, we can serve as a, a, a court. We can open a court case. We can support everybody to come and report to us, even the highest person in the authority, in the, in the in, in public office, and then they will have to come and answer. So that means an investigation will be put on. And if there are evidences that the person or the police officer was a culprit, or was the, was the, uh, the uh, was the culprit, the person who deliberately did the crime, then the person would be recommended uh, for immediate, um, how they call it, prosecution. Just an example, one commissioner in the Gambia uh, mishandled uh, a culprit and then hit the guy until the person's genitalia was wounded and had to be uh, hospitalized. So we made an investigation involving the police in the task force that investigated this. We came up with a report and it was established clearly that the police commissioner actually violated the right of the individual. And then the police commissioner was immediately demoted. It's true that our recommendation was to put immediate action. He should have been prosecuted, but it wasn't done. However, he was demoted. He was sent to a, a rural area. And uh, in a way, it was demotivating for him. Um, ideally, we would have preferred that him be prosecuted. But in a state where police brutality occurs, normally the state should take action immediately to correct it. If the state refuses to do that, then the commission can openly, um, how do you call it, uh, advocate, not only to the state, but to the international body to put pressure on the government. To ensure the that Human Rights Commission. Exactly, the Human Rights Commission and the civil society okay. organizations. Remember, the Human Rights Commission is always backed by the, hum the civil society organizations. The civil society organizations are independent, uh, but then they are private. But the commission is actually a state agency, which is also independent. It stands independent alone like a judiciary. It is not a fourth uh, arm of government, but it can stand independent and impartial in the way it, um, it, it investigates and then uh, makes reports or advisory notes to government on matters of human rights violations. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Barry. He is the head of the Human Rights Commission in the Gambia. I will leave you now because you want to break your fast. Let me go to Dr. Anne. Uh, Dr. Before Anne. I leave, there is a question somebody asked. He said whether we can summon the president. Okay. <laughs> As a commission, uh, we can recommend um, if, 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 the, if the president is consistently or persistently violating uh, rights that we feel are the rights of the people, what we can do is not necessarily summon the president. The only state agency that can summon the president is the parliament. So we will write to the parliament. We have a, a standing committee for human rights. Through them, we will put press on them to summon the president to parliament and make sure that the president answers to those rights. If they are not satisfied, then they can, they can now impeach the president or go further beyond that. But we cannot summon the president to come and report. However, if there are any agency responsible for violation, not necessarily directly by the president, it could be um, his national guard, it could be the army, it could be the police, we can summon the head of that agency to come and report. And if they don't, then it could be a court case. We can, we can summon them through judiciary and they, could, they would be obliged to answer. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Um, like I said, he is the head of the Gambian uh, uh, Human Rights Commission. Um, so uh, let me go to Dr. Ann. Um, the health system um, in Sierra Leone is especially, Dr. Ann, are you with me? Yes, I'm right here. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. The health system of Sierra Leone and especially public hospitals are in deplorable state. Sierra mm -hmm. die of curable diseases due to lack of proper health care facilities. Most of the hospital equipment are not functional. Yes. Electricity and water supply are absent. There has been an increase in maternal mortality rate. Mm -hmm. as, a, as a health public health expert and a professor of epidemiology, should building a community hospital or rather improve on the existing hospitals to get them functional um, be the so solvent situation of the government? Absolutely, I think it should be. And you're absolutely right that access to hospitals is extremely limited. And even when people get to the hospital, there's no electricity, the sanitation is poor. Um, there may not be enough doctors or nurses and people die. Um, so that's a fundamental role 
I would argue, of government. So when you're looking at monies being taken away by the president, the first lady, that's literally money being taken away that should be used for new hospitals, improving hospitals, new schools, improving education, um, reducing poverty, making sure everybody has food. When you're when you know you're thinking about somebody taking a vacation to Lebanon, costing a million dollars. What, where does that money even go? You know, are they buying houses in Europe or the US? Are they um, hidden bank accounts somewhere that just enrich themselves? And at the same time, there are people going hungry, fundamentally hungry and dying or dying, you know, when um, there was the terrible landslide a couple of years ago, that it was very difficult to rescue people, to get them to hospitals and to save them. And they shouldn't have been living in those conditions to begin with. But if the if the president is taking literally taking away that money, then he and the first lady are taking away fundamental human rights to food, health, education, and good housing. So it's it's when you think about the, these monies being diverted for probably personal use. Um, it literally is causing death. People die as a result. All right. Um, um, recently, I heard that um, the president um, is launching, I think, a, a new structure to build a community hospital. My question here is, um, should they really work on the old hospital or the hospital that we have now and get them functional rather than going to open or going to build a new hospital? I can't say that I, I would have to say I don't know. Um, I think that where there's structures available, it makes economic sense to start with um, rehabilitating those and getting them up to par, as well as building new hospitals or even um, new um, local public health clinics that people can get to easily. Because a lot of health problems can be taken care of with, um, antibiotics, with um, making sure water is clean with basic public health that doesn't even need to go to the hospital. It can be um, taken care of by nurses or doctors in a local clinic. So I think my answer to that is um, probably doing both. But I think working with existing infrastructure makes sense because there's, there's a limit to how much money is available anyway. And there's cases I can think of in West Africa, and here I'm thinking of Nigeria, where I've seen new hospitals built and they're just sitting there because they're new hospitals, but there's not enough doctors, not enough nurses, not enough electricity to actually run them. So it's a brand new empty hospital just sitting there. So it's not just about building the hospital, it's about everything that okay. goes with it. Like you say, the electricity, sanitation, right. water. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ann. We are going to round up very shortly with the, the, um, the interview and we'll move to the next session, which is the question and answer. Let me go to you, Chair, now. Um, we, we all understand that corruption is corruption. But if you were to put the corruption in Sierra Leone on a scale, how would you compare under the former president Bio, uh, former president Koma administration, and the current president Bio administration when we talk about corruption on the scale in Sierra Leone? Well, um, I know that that could be a very it has the response to that has political implications in itself because um, we always think about this party versus this other party. The question I think is. Um, getting us to see what is the level of corruption, whether corruption has reduced or it has exploded beyond what we all uh, are hearing from the state. The government's argument is that corruption has been minimized. They've been rated by the MCC. The national indicators are showing that they've done well with the fight against corruption. But when you put on a scale, what we're looking at is of a different kind of uh, proportional, proportionality of, of corruption in the sense that we have said, we've checked the bank records, for example, for the last 30 years. We've never had a situation where the wife of a president has um, a bank account that is directly funded by the president. So that makes the corruption different. We've never seen a situation where a president over the last 30 years has taken out of the central bank 
$400,000 on, on a single transaction. We've never seen this one billion. Um, and this is, I'm speaking from the record, looking at the bank, uh, the bank of selling records from um, 2000 um, to 1990. And if you look at that, you might see that uh, President Bill's expenditure exceeds all of these uh, presidential expenditures we're talking about and frivolous spending, wasteful spending. That's what we're talking about. So when you put that on the scale, I have said the corruption under the Bureau administration that we're looking at has doubled the corruption we witnessed under the Kuruma regime in 10 years. So you have to uh, multiply these to 10 times to be able to arrive at some kind of a scale if you want to put it on a scale. But we have new manifestations of corruption. What has covered this is the fact that legal mechanisms have been used to um, divert public money in the name of, um, that's why the state is pretending it's normal because travel expenditure. What did the president do with $270,000 in five days? What did the president do with $1 million to Lebanon? What did the president do with $3 million in one year on supposed travel when the whole world was on a shutdown? This is different kind of manifestation of corruption we've never seen on the record. And I'm not talking about um, just for the Bureau administration, we are looking at record going back. And we've challenged the government, for example, to show us if they claim that um, the office of the first lady has already be, has always been funded, show us the evidence. We've said the first time the central bank opened an account over the last 30 years for the wife of a president happened in June, 2018, when the Bureau administration came to power. They haven't um, denied that. They are only saying they opened the account. Now the Minister of Finance said they opened the account to increase transparency. How, how can you open well, 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 open well, from, from the response I'm getting now, it's like um, some people from the chat box are saying most parties are equally corrupt. So that is why I said um, from a, yeah, from a scale of corruption, we all no agree corruption. corruption is corruption. No. I am not how saying, do you, yeah. I'm you, not saying there is no corruption or there was no corrupt, the corruption did not precede BO. But that's not what I'm saying. I am saying the manifestations of corruption that we've seen are new. For example, we've never had a situation where the wife of a president receives more money than, than uh, line ministries in government. In 2018, for example, the office of the first lady or the wife of the president received over 8 billion allocated from this uh, consolidated revenue fund to her account. The Ministry of Information did not receive within the same time period, did not receive up to 1 billion loans. Same for the Ministry of um, uh, Social Welfare, Gender and Children's Affairs, which received little above two billion. And that was because they were, the money was supposed to fund the Hajj operations of the Ministry of Social Welfare. So we are saying the, the First Lady received seven times more than government ministries. The First Lady received four times more than the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In fact, much of the money that went to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs came from the Chinese embassy in Twitter. So we've never seen that kind of operation. That is not to say there was no corruption, there was no graft under the Kuruma. And if we aggregate all of this, we're talking about between the office of the uh, president, the first lady and the chief minister, we're talking about 100 billion loans that we've reported in, with three individuals alone. And many of that, or 80% of that is taken out of the bank, central bank cash. Some of it is spent in supposed travel, which um, no retirements, were made. And uh, for example, we're talking about the Office of the First Lady's account, just one account at the central bank. We haven't touched the uh, bank account that is at the local commercial bank. We also reported that there's a third account that's held by the Mada and Fatima Bio Foundation, which is a charity organization run by the president and his wife, where money is being collected from government ministries agencies. We showed, for example, how Nasif contributed 50 million loans to the uh, president's uh, foundation, which from pension funds. So this kind of corruption, we've never seen it in the, on the record. On that the records, okay. And then we are saying, if you aggregate this in total, it has doubled the corruption we reported or we witnessed under the Kuruma administration. This is from the record. If the government says otherwise, and we haven't seen this because it is covered what, what? through these legal mechanisms until we are bringing okay, it. Okay, so, so in, in other words, it's a different pattern, uh, you know, in, in, in corruption. There's a different pattern to read with this administration. But let me ask you Innovative, something. Let me ask you, what let me we ask are, you a personal Innovative question. Innovative mechanisms have been added to the corruption, to state corruption. That's what we are saying. This China, government has innovated new mechanics, new mechanisms to which they steal public money. 
and they pretend it's legal. Let me ask you a personal question, Chairman. Do you have any personal issue with President Bill? I don't know for what doing this. No, this is not this is not anything personal because the fact of the matter is we I published two books under Kuruma uh, <laughs> that talked about uh, corruption um, under the Kuruma administration. The a critique I wrote the first in the general critique of Kuruma's handling of the Ebola outbreak before all these people. In fact, the SLPP's newspaper um, re republished page by page um, that entire book. And the SLPP newspapers and supporters of the president, those who are now saying I have a personal um, vendetta against the president, were the ones, including the president, who were even participating in circulating information, articles that I will write against the previous. Uh, I've been doing this for 20 years now, not beginning, uh, preceding Kuruma. With, with, I was editor of Concord Times. I'm, I'm asking you. I'm asking you to say yes. I'm asking you to say that no, because no. I've had, I've had questions where people are asking or commenting that uh, probably China has you know some personal issue with President no, Bill. No, no That's personal. why he's going to all those level. So I just want you to establish the fact. No, there is nothing personal between myself and the president, and I know all these individuals in government, those in the past and those at the present. Why? Because I've been active in Sierra Leone for the last 20, 21 years now as a journalist, an activist myself, somebody who has been doing this work for this. So virtually there is no one who is in power or outside of power that I haven't met personally, that All I right. met personally, but there is no personal, um, okay. there's no personal in me reporting that the wife of the president has received $3 million. The question is, does the evidence support that? Yes, they haven't denied the evidence. There's evidence to everything that was published. That should be the question, not Mary. Okay, I think people people are, I think um, my guests and um, viewers watching are, you know, putting themselves together with their questions. Um, Patrick, I want to go to you before we get to the question and answer session. Patrick, um, the late Tanzania president, uh, Magufuli, assumed office in November 2015. And he asserted a strong stance against public spending and discouraged foreign travel by his senior government officials. He made his first visit to Rwanda in April 2016, five months after assuming office. From 2016 to 2019, he traveled nine times to African countries only, yet, he made a rapid transformation in Tanzania in five years before his death. Okay, my question is, does international traveling by African president a must for development or a contributing factor leading to corruption? Uh, thank you. And uh, that's a wonderful observation that you make regarding public officials, international travel and corruption and uh, development and uh, putting uh, Tanz the late Tanzanian uh, president into perspective is a, a good way to look at this. But I want to say that um, though other countries have equally been critical of many travels made by presidents, uh, to my knowledge, there has been lack of evidence Back up, backed up with detailed analyses, like the one that Africanist Press has done on Sierra Leone today. However, I would want to give a few examples uh, that uh, we can relate to. Uh, in Nigeria, for example, uh, Nigerians uh, went onto social media platform and reacted sternly to the frequent overseas travel by President uh, Buhari. And uh, going by the analyses, uh, in the first three years alone, uh, in his first tenure, Buhari is said to have made uh, up to about, uh, combined in total, about 404 days uh, of absence in the country. Uh, uh, and that alone, people say that denied him the uh, ability to sit and address um, economic issues within his country. Uh, I know people have talked about uh, the advancement of, uh, of Rwanda and what the Rwandese president is doing, but I would want to highlight that uh, uh, 
he is one of the most traveled presidents uh, in, in the continent. In 2018, um, President Paul Kagame is said to have gone to 34 countries in five continents and about 45 trips in 2019. That is over almost over 100 uh, trips uh, to, to say, to just to summarize. Compared this to, um, uh, the former president of the United States, uh, President Obama, in his entire eight years, made only 52 international trips. Coming back to where I come from in Kenya, uh, President Uru Kenyatta made over 100 trips by 2019 uh, alone. Together, travel by government officials is said to have pushed the domestic and foreign travels to over 15 a billion um, Kenya shillings. Uh, that's about uh, uh, 15 million US dollars. And there is no doubt that this money could be channeled to important infrastructure such as schools and hostels that Dr. Wallis was talking about. So to go back to your question, whether you know uh, international travels uh, or, or presidential travels and development is tied, of course it is, because looking at all the money that is being used to, to travel. But again, you ask yourself, uh, when these travels happen, what exactly do people get? We've had situations where presidents have uh, visited, for example, China and came back with overburdening loans that uh, people have to go back and pay generations and, gener uh, and generations to come. I would want to highlight that recently the Ken um, Kenyans took to social media to protest a 2.3 billion international monetary fund loan to Kenya. And the argument was that the East African country, that is Kenya, is already burdened with loans. And over 160,000 people signed this petition asking IMF to cancel the recently approved loan because previous disbursements to Kenya have been lost in corruption scandals, which remain unpaid. And I want to say that right now, Kenya is almost 7 trillion shillings in debt, which will be paid generations after generations. And these are coming out of uh, travels that the president uh, has made, uh, as opposed to coming with maybe um, a debt uh, a relief or something that is not happening. Uh, on top of that, uh, uh, around 2014, uh, Kenya floated a euro bond of two billion uh, that was supposed to be paid over time. The money disappeared um, somewhere along the chain of transferring money. So I would want to say that what, what else do people gain uh, when these foreign trips happen? Of course, there is overwhelming, uh, overwhelming foreign debt uh, that comes into the country that burdens uh, uh, the, the ordinary citizens in terms of debt. They cannot afford basic, um, basic needs. They have to go and pay taxes. They have to uh, incur the high cost of doing business. So in general, in summary, yes, uh, the uh, travels. But, but in, 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 in our own situation, because you also have been following the, the political you know, um, situation in Sierra Leone as well. But in our own situation, does how much um, does foreign traveling impact the lives of Sierra Leone or how much does foreign traveling has developed Sierra Leone? Uh, yeah, back, back to what I was saying that um, uh, considering the amount of money that has gone to the travel alone, asking ourselves how much of that money could have been used in equipping um, the infrastructure that is in the country, how much of that money would have been used to pay uh, workers a uh, considerable amount of money that can be able to uh, make them offer services. So generally there is a lot that is tied to the money that is being used in foreign travels. And I do believe that it is not only foreign travels around. In country travel, it's also an area that is not, you know, is, is not focused on. And that also has a lot of money because when presidents travel, they travel with huge amounts of crowds going to either local trips or, or international trips. And these are taxpayers' money that could be focused on doing development-oriented projects that will serve the people. 
Absolutely. Um, this is exactly what we want to uh, um, understand here, that some of these monies um, have yielded no benefits to the, to the citizens and there has not been any changes you know, to the country or to the development of the country. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, he's um, associate editor of the African Express. Okay, now we're going to the moment everybody is waiting for, which is the question and answer um, session. So um, on this um, segment, um, if you want to ask um, the panelists, any of, you, uh, any of you want to ask the panelists questions, you can please um, raise your arm. There is a there is a there is a, something on the on the on the um, below that say okay yes somebody wants to ask the question thumbs up um, can you please bring the person on the screen please what's your name can you can you tell us your name please. Uh, Suleiman Fona. Okay. I want to ask. Are you are you are you with me? All right. Um, in regards to, you know, uh, the things uh, Cherno has been raising, I just want to ask Cherno to just give us a few examples on the the uh, sophistication methods that the SLPP has used to siphon money from that country. Because what confuses us sometimes, you see a government that has serious human rights abuses, stealing so much money, and until the African is pressed, they were able to get a $400 million grant from the MCC, something terribly wrong is wrong. And they're doing something very sophisticated here. I mean, using civil society, using the press, but I mean, you can tell me better. How, uh, what's the sophistication? Can I mean, give, give us one or two examples of this, this sophisticated process? To, to okay, thank you. So I, I don't know if I should respond to that or I will wait for more questions. Yes, yes, it's for you, Cherno. Yeah, uh, um, um, Cherno, can you just take it one after the other and make it brief because there are so many people that want to ask questions. Exactly, I, I think we, in the first place, we have to ask ourselves, why is this conversation mm -hmm. not happening in Sierra Leone? So you can, see, you can see that there's an effort to keep this conversation out from the media and all of that. And there's an effort on the part of the media and some of the business community in Sierra Leone to help the government to water down the significance for our publications. Why has this conversation become international news, but has not made significant um, uh, headway into the traditional press, apart from the new media that we have, this kind of technology. So that tells you the interest at stake. And we, we reported how much money was spent in hiring international firms to do a pu public relations campaign to launder the image of the government. We can say a lot about that, but we intend to show some of these different components as we move along. But they've used a the payroll, they've used the international travel. Many, much of this money that you see on procurement and all that, it's not, it's going someplace else. We are committed to showing first this exit, how the money exit the banks, and then the destination points of these monies and perhaps what they are used in their final destination. So that's what this is. We are trying to tell a transnational story of this, this corruption story by the end is going to be a transnational narrative that connects the movement of money from Sierra Leone to different destinations and where perhaps these monies are kept and what they have been used but we tell you through international travel we've said this in some of the reports through international travel through this cash flows and procurements you cannot explain um eight hundred thousand dollars in furniture to one company alone within a year that money went someplace else we're going to show that as we move along Someone want to ask, I think Mr. Israel. All right, okay, let me get to, um, um, let me get to Yusuf. Uh, Israel, don't worry, I'm coming to you. Let me get to Yusufu Jalo. Can you unmute? Okay. Yes, um, uh, it's great to be here. Um, really good to, to listen to this very, very intelligent um, 
uh, discussion that we are having here. Now, uh, my question is, um, I probably am going to be a devil's advocate here, um, or, try, um, or if you like, I'm trying to flip the uh, flip the, the card a little bit, because I, I, I asked a genuine question on, um, on my Facebook page, and as I asked, I said, can somebody please genuinely tell me what, um, what are some of the great things, I use that word very deliberately, that the government is doing that maybe we are not seeing. Someone replied to me this, and I wonder just because I want to put this in light of everything that is going on. Somebody replied this to me, Cherno. He says, 52 villages are getting connected to solar mini grids this year. 5,000 new teachers are now on government payroll. 3,000 schools have been captured into government support. 400 tractors have been given to private sector players across the whole of Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone is not Freetown. Judge the government on rural water supply, rural electrification policy shifts into private sector-led agriculture, and you will see improvement. Judge them by what is happening in Freetown, they will fail. It goes on to say that they went, this person said, went to the entire Cambia and Potloko district. Every village has boreholes and portable water. It says the Ministry of Youth, through the Youth in, in Fishing Project, has given over 100 boats to youth groups in, um, in River Rhine communities. Mm -hmm. How do we measure this or put this? In um in comparison to what we are already talking about in terms of the in terms of the co um in terms of co um um, co uh, um corruption. Yes, I I I think it's good um that someone uh brings the side of government what government would ordinarily say because this is this is basically the um information that you will find in the president's website you find in all the conversation that's happening out there. And rightly so, we expect that the purpose of a government is to provide social services to the people. Right. That's, that's why governments are elected. When governments deliver on provide social services to its citizens, that's the purpose of the social contract. That is not charity. It is not something we do not expect less. We expect more from that kind of thing. But um, the question of uh, uh, some of the teachers, I will comment on the teacher payroll because that is, for, to me, very fundamental and which is what we intend to publish in the up, incoming weeks when we finish with the Office of the President. We are going to the Minister of Finance. In case finance people are listening, we come in there and we'll be addressing the question of the payroll. And the question of the payroll, I will tell you up front from the record I have, this government has not added more than a thousand teachers over the last three years on the payroll. This government has not added more than or up to 1,000 uh, healthcare workers on the payroll. I will, we will publish not just the new payroll, we will also publish, we will disaggregate the amount of new public sector workers or new employees that have been added on the payroll. I will tell you alone, for consultants alone, we have checked uh, people named as consultants employed by this government over the last three years at the state house or outside of the state house. Some of them carry titles as ambassadors, plenty potentially advisors and all of that. When we aggregate their uh, annual cost on the treasury in rent allowances alone is over a billion leons, okay? Over, over 10 billion leons. We have that record, we we'll publish that. So what I'm trying to say is that much of that information you've read out there constitute public propaganda from the state. I will not argue around boreholes, electricity to the villages. I will leave that to Sierra Leoneans to decide for themselves in Kono, whether they have 90% 24 hour electricity, whether they have, uh, the president himself recently said there is no sufficient electricity because the transformers have been stolen. So that is upon Sierra Leoneans to decide for themselves whether they have electricity, water supply, access to healthcare. But I will tell you the argument around the payroll regarding the increase in the number of teachers and healthcare workers, that I will tell you up front is false because I have on record the amount of teachers that have been added. Okay. The All right, let's, the let us move. Um, we have lots of, uh, lots of people here ready to ask questions. Let us move to um, Ahmed Sisse, your hand is up, Ahmed Sisse. 
representing the APC party. We can hear Ahmed. Ahmed, can you unmute? Uh, Ahmed, we cannot hear you. We can hear you. Oh my God. All right, okay, while, we, while you're getting, you know, sorted out, let me look at, um, okay, Israel, Israel, can you speak up, Israel? Okay, Ahmed. Hello? Ahmed, can you? Okay. Ahmed, oh, can, can you? you okay, now? Ahmed is on now. I'm sorry. Ahmed is on okay. now. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for having me, Rachel. Now, <clears throat> initially, I was enlisted on this panel as a representative of the APC, and I am going to talk to you as a citizen, uh, not like uh, from a partisan perspective. Even though um, we're both culprits in your views, the APC and the SLPP, judging uh, our history of governance, we're both culprits. But the difference here is we in the APC are willing to, to learn. And when you accuse us uh, during the Ebola of uh, you brought in such claims, we try and engage and did not raise an uproar of in the magnitude we're seeing today. Now, let me ask you this, Mr. Chenlo. Okay, yes, um, the Anti-Corruption Commission Act made provision. I'm going to ask you two questions. I will encourage you to have a pen. The Anti-Corruption Commission make provision in Section 81 of the Anti-Corruption Act for protection of informers. In other words, for whistleblowers. Okay, I just want to ask you whether you feel protected judging from their utterances in the past. And I will also like to remind you that on the same act, section 8.0 of the Anti-Corruption Act, it gives the commission the power to decline investigation. That is, there is a discretion. Do you think that the commission should rely on this to decline investigating your claims, citing that, especially in terms of the first lady that it has been captured under audit and there is no, there should be no uproar. That's one. And the second question, your claims were reported by the chief executive of the uh, PPA, National Procurement Agency, that in reliance on section 39, subsection two, it gives the Minister of Finance to utilize unallocated finances, okay? Now you've already reiterated that that is subject to parliament approval and in fact it is quite it should be quarterly all expenditure must be submitted to uh parliament um uh, quarterly okay but they're saying that they have so it's good you subdivided your allegations into two one is procedural impropriety that is failing to notify the parliament and the second is the way they expend their money do you think that parliament should go blameless among this? I think uh, that is like we have now three, we'll say three questions <laughs> from you. But it's, it's fair enough, they are all uh, related. On the question of uh, my, whether I feel safe, uh, safety questions and the Anti-Corruption Commission, don't forget Honorable Ibrahim Tawakonte of the Salem People's Party recently issued a statement saying that he reported corruption in parliament and uh, uh, to the, in parliament to the anti-corruption commissioner or the anti-corruption commission. The anti-corruption commission did not treat him as uh, somebody who raised the alarm bells, but treated him as a suspect in his own report. So then he said he wasn't um, protected. So the anti-corruption commission, I'm not doing this for the anti-corruption commission to protect me. Of course, I have received and I continue to receive insults from members of the government, from their supporters. And I have even published details of phone numbers of people who have been sending me not just insults, but 
threatening messages. That's the, 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 that's aside. But um, there are other mechanisms that one can use. I've reported these to organizations and making them known, including uh, security agencies where I live. So that's one part. Um, I do not I do not expect the anti-corruption to do otherwise because they are on record to say that we are sensational. So that is one part of it. On this question of, um, I think the most important question here is the allocation, like you said, um, the estimate, there is nowhere in the budgetary estimates submitted by the Ministry of Finance where the Office of the First Lady appeared as a budgetary line of expenditure. And not only that, the supplementary budgetary estimates where Parliament, if, if the minister uses money that is not in the budgetary estimates, they have to go to Parliament and seek approval for money that has already been expended or money that they intend to expend as additional expenditure unforeseen in the previous estimate. And this government, under this government, they've presented two supplementary budgetary estimates. You can look at them. There is nowhere any line on the expenditure or allocation of the Office of the First Lady is reflected. When we raised this report, the first defense, first line of defense was the Office of the First Lady is under the Office of the President. And now they are saying it's a standalone office. They are justifying it. So the, on the question of um, uh, the audit, the audits have been stated explicitly in the 2019 audit report that the Office of the First Lady refused to be audited. They did not submit uh, transaction records of their uh, operations because it means that the, the, if you receive public money, you are supposed to be audited. In fact, a member of parliament from the APC was interviewed on AYB in which he said, which I think is the most perfect statement that captures the, this entire controversy, that the audit service had no business, in fact, trying to audit the audit of the facility because it's an illegal institution. If an illegal institution or uh, an institution that's not supposed to receive public money, receives public money, the, 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 the order should be that the money should be refunded. It should not be, you should not audit them regarding the use of money they are not supposed to receive in the first place. Because you can only audit an institution that is supposed to be audited, which is an institution that is under the governance arrangement of the country. Okay, the, the Office of the First Lady is not part of the MDAs of the government. It's not a branch of the MDA, it's not a unit of an MDA. So it should not be audited on its own. So if it receives money on its own, the logical thing there will be to ask them to refund the money, which perhaps is the role of parliament to do. Parliament should order the Minister of Finance to appear before it in parliament to explain how they allocated more money how they illegally allocated this money and why the Office of the First Lady received more money than even the line ministries. So if you are arguing that, the, because the argument is that there's a caveat in the, in the finance regulations that says that the Minister of Finance can use 1% of the budgetary estimates, which is even not, not what the law says, but they are saying the expenditure regulations say that, or the finance regulation says that they can use 1% of on budgeted expenditure, that's off budgetary expenditure to the level of 1% of the total annual budget. Now the total annual, uh, what is allocated to the first lady is more than what is seven times more than other ministries. So how can you call that 1%? It's an irregular, illegal and hidden expenditure. But even the 1% regulation is saying, it's within MDAs or ministries, ministries, government agencies and departments. For example, if the Ministry of Transport annual budgetary estimate, they ask the Minister of Finance to allocate to them 10 billion, and they happen to use 11 billion, if they happen to use more money than the 10 billion, they should not use more than 1% of that projected estimate, not the annual or the country level. That's not what the law says. For example, if, if, if a ministry has been given 10 billion or it has 10 billion as projected uh, budgetary allocation or budgetary expenditure, and they were given that, and they have the need to use more money than they actually requested. And if they use that money, the Minister of Finance should take that expend added expenditure to Parliament in, by way of a supplementary budgetary estimate to Parliament for approval, which means Parliament must approve the money that has been used that was not approved, and then okay. request for the use of money that they want to use that was not in the primary uh, appropriation bill or budgetary estimate. So that is the law. None of these okay. followed, but the Bureau administration has a, has a pattern of flouting regulation, not just on finances, even in Parliament, in proceeding. In, in, look at what is happening with the controversy regarding the census. It's, it's within the DNA of their logic of governance. That's the logic of, the, of governance. They have flouted laws from the beginning and they continue to do that right through the 30 years. And it, you can find it everywhere on management with public resources, the 
simple governance uh, approach to governance. This is the part. It's a lawless approach to, to governing the country, flouting the law, using right. the terms. Okay, like I said, we have lots of you know hands here, and I'm going to take it from Israel, Matilda, and Sheba. So let's start with Israel first. Your question, please. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting us. And uh, it's a very uh, educating uh, discussion. And I want to thank Mr. Barr very much for the education he's giving to the country, even for those who will not be satisfied. My question actually was two parts. The first one was based on, as a follow-up question from what Suleiman uh, uh, asked in the begin at, at the beginning. And also, Mr. Barr, you've published several uh, evidence from the record, as a I must disclose, I am a practical. I'm a, I'm a retired banker now. I worked in Sierra Leone in the bank. I work in the city of London in the bank, and I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a customer service man, not, not the high office, uh, and pusher. So, I, and I also am a lecturer. I'm a lecturer in banking and, and, and especially practical banking. So, I am seeing a pattern here, which from the records you show, when you were talking about the purchasing of. Uh, furniture, for instance. There were several funds, several withdrawals, which were below 60,000. 60 million. 60, sorry, 60 million. And the, the frequency of those transactions appears to me, from my own experience, I must also disclose that I, I was head of investigations when I was in the CCI in London in, 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 for four years. I can see a pattern that the persons who are responsible for withdrawing those funds have not got the power to sign checks or authorization above the 60,000 or 60 right. million. Mm -hmm. So they are patterning their withdrawals below the threshold. It appears also to me there has been a chain of, there's a linking chain between procurement people as well, because it appears from the procurement laws there are a limit as to which combined uh, purchases could be made. Because we have the advantage of looking not only at customer accounts, we also have the ability to go in and see the, the goods. Now you have reported several, several purchases within made to particular individuals, also with the chief minister's office. Uh, I don't want to go into the legality of uh, how the, the, this office were established. Because for, the, for me, from the experience I have in Sierra Leone, and, and I, I have a very good experience from auditing as well, very good experience. And from my experience, it appears to me that even the, 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 the first lady's office appears to be an NGO, private NGO. It's not even a Quango. It's not even a quasi-governmental organization. So there is no reason for the finance minister to even twist the 1%. That when you calculate it, I think it was Matilda's, one of Matilda's uh, program once I was watching when the calculations were coming, it's far exceeded the 1%. What I want you to, to, to confirm is, we can see that there's a pattern in using loopholes in the law to justify. Uh, it appears as if they are trying to rationalize uh, and the, the, the most important thing, a, a, a interesting thing is there is no denial. There is no denial. If there were denial, okay. so those people who try to defend, I cannot see how they can defend somebody who has not denied. Okay, There's thank no you denial. very much. Israel. Now the question is, my second question, please, what I want to ask Mr. Bai is to confirm to me whether my suspicion as to these patterns are correct. And secondly, on your book of the Ebola, you accused the Orthodox Congress government. You wrote a, 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 a very nice book. I mean, I, I have a copy of it. And what I'm seeing now, even Ben Kervala, I have the video where he denied that the APC government actually bungled that money. And we had the, the IMF, uh, the Indian man with the turban. I think it was. I think it must be a Sikh. When it happened, when the accusations were going on before the government the election, he said there was no misuse of that Ebola phone. And it has turned out that the, the Red Cross and um, another body, international body were. So do you now feel from what you were reporting that you were not 
quite correct uh, from what we have now seen that the Ebola fund was not misused by the previous government based upon what Ben Kerkwana's own investigation has said, I'm talking about the anti-corruption commissioner, and also what the Indians have said. All right, thank you very much, Israel. Well, that was a long am, question. Am. <laughs> All right, um, uh, uh, Cherno, you can make it very snappy because we have yeah. lots of people who wants to talk to you. Of course, I'm, I'm happy that you are reading the patterns, uh, Mr. Israel. I think, um, like I said, a bank evidence is basically a DNA. It can be interpreted, you know, it's a raw material that we can use variedly. Each time I look at it, I see something different. Each time I look at it with my colleagues, we see something different. We can build 1,000 stories from it. But I think the most important question here, yes, um, the difference between the Ebola, what we have in the Ebola book, in fact, much of that evidence comes from the audit service was my primary source of analysis when it came to the mismanagement of Ebola funds. Not only that, even President Kuruma himself um, by then said that he called for an audit of international funding. So much, each of the, each of the uh, conclusions drawn there were supported by uh, not the primary record as we have it in this case, because every that comes to a very fundamental question that people have been asking me, why haven't you done the same kind of work with the with the Kroma regime, okay? And I can tell you that I have looked at the, the transaction records for the last 30 years of the bank in itself, and I can see that um, what we reported, what the audit service reported regarding the misuse of Ebola funds was exactly the case. I can, I can say that now looking at the record, but I built that analysis based on the conclusions I draw, I came to on the Ebola book was based on evidence from other organizations who had already interacted with, with, with the government of Sierra Leone and who have reported the missing funds. That include the MSF, it includes the IMF, it includes um, the range of other organizations, including the audit service. So they, they provided an Africa confidential, I think some of some of it that deals with the question of the, the contract to the Lebanese um, came from that. So I stand by the evidence I published in the past and I can justify it today. And now looking at the record, the primary record that I'm dealing with 30 years back, I can also see that perhaps if I was writing that book today, it would be more detailed than with, with, okay. the, with the crimes and allegations than they were in the, in the book, but nothing there is, is, is beyond uh, what actually was evidential. All right, um, so I'm moving to Matilda, Sheba and um, Madam Femi Claudius Cole. So over to you, Matilda. So is it my Matilda or another Matilda? I, I, I see two Matilda on, so I have to be sure. Which <laughs> Matilda Cole, I'm sorry, Matilda Cole. <laughs> Okay, good. Okay. Hi, everyone. So um, two questions for now. First question goes to um, Chelno and the presidential town hall, the president stated that um, when he was asked, and I quote not verbatim, um, is the current um, economy in a free fall? is the Sierra Leone um, you know, monet monetary system as we know it in free fall and its um, foreign exchange rate um, are supposed to um, pitted against international exchange, exchange currency. The president said, absolutely not. And that these things must be understood within financial terms and that the governor has put in place safeguards in order for our um, currency not to be in free fall. However, on a day-to-day -day basis, we do notice that for some of us who send remittances back home or engage in charity or whatever we do, um, we know that the exchange rate is never the same. We know that we are paying a lot more um, for less money even though it might seem voluminous or, or, or big or large. However, we know that the earning, the buying power of that money is, is, is nothing, you know, to write home about really. So um, with that said, knowing what you know, 
looking at your data, looking at your financial records and your evidences, is the president justify or right in saying that we have a governor who controls, I wouldn't use the word control, but, but who monitors international standard and therefore have put our country in, 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 in situations to safeguard our economy and also that our economy is not in free falls. Um, free fall, again, knowing what you know. Um, and my second question will go to um, Dr. Um, Wallace. Um, to you, um, working um, you know, in the healthcare sector, knowing what you know, given the evidences um, published by the African Express, let's dollarize these evidences. And let's say Sierra Leone is a country that doesn't have a diagnostic center. Um, we send out patients and fund, crowdfund to send people outside of Sierra Leone when they become grave and critically ill, that including doctors. Recently, a young doctor was diagnosed with, I believe it was cervical cancer, and people like us have to had to crowdfund him and um, crowdfund and appeal, you know, to the international community, to Sierra Leoneans around the globe, to say this is one of our own. We cannot let her, you know, sleep and perish, um, you know, at the hands of this terrible disease that we know. Um, and we have a lot of children, malnourished children. We have a lot of women dying within our societies, not only from childbirth and, 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 and mortality, but also from you know, um, primary and secondary diseases. Knowing what you know, looking at the evidence, what could this money or alleged missing money, what tangible, and I say tangible um, transformation could they have um, you know, impacted within the Sierra Leonean society for Sierra Leoneans looking specifically at the health set in the health sector department? Thank you. So who wants to take it first, Anne or Chairman? No, let's uh, Professor Wallace start. Okay, I'll, I'll try okay. to take it. Um, it. That is a really, really very good question. And um, it speaks to the very fundamental problem that if a country does not have enough money, it can't have the most basic health care. It can't train doctors. It can't train nurses. It can't alleviate hunger. So in this case, money is actually being funneled a lot of money that comes from taxes, that comes from international sources, um, that includes charity money, um, is being literally funneled away from the country for we don't know what, right? That same money is what should be going into a basic infrastructure of healthcare that prevents and then treats where treatment is necessary so that people don't have to crowdfund and leave the country. This is the responsibility, I think, of the government. And, and th therein lies the whole problem. Um, I think you've, in a way, I mean, you're answering the question better than I can even, you're stating it better than I can answer it because um, it's just so basic. It comes down to, is there enough food? Are there enough doctors? Are doctors leaving Sierra Leone once they're trained because they get paid better elsewhere and they have better conditions? So there's brain drain. Um, I don't have an answer, but I do think that there's direct link between loss of money or misuse of money and whether or not there's fundamentally good public health. So I wish I could answer that better, but that's, I see um, in the comments that I'm being a savior's complex. Um, I would like to deny that. Um, I don't see what I've said that has anything to do with a savior's complex. This is basic fundamental human rights. And um, yeah, I'm gonna leave it at that. 
All right, Chino, um, do you want to answer to the second question from Matilda? Yeah, I, I think the, the question of um, inflation, we have to, inflation and the currency, the value of the currency is basically one that can be answered by each one of us from Sierra Leone. We already know that by December, the banks have been in crisis with um, lack of, lack of um, currencies, lack of uh, people going to the banks to have access to their own savings and withdrawals. They cannot have access to money that they've kept in the banks. So that is not just a coincidental, it's the result of fiscal policies, the result of um, what we're talking about, the looting of the treasury. You know, where individuals who have no money in the banks are going to the banks and taking money out of the banks as if that money belongs to them. So when you do that, you basically looting the currency out of the country and that goes away. And it comes to what uh, Professor Wallace has been talking about. The question is how much of that money will have been used to undertake social and economic development in healthcare, in agriculture, in uh, education. They're talking about now when you talk to this government, what they talk about is free quality education. And there's a question and they tend to uh, point to the fact that they've added healthcare workers on the payroll, they've added teachers, but all of these people are complaining that they're not receiving salaries. They're not being paid. So how can you uh, talk about teacher recruitment, healthcare recruit recruitment in the health sector, when now as we speak, we have this incident that happened in the central hospital in Freetown. So there are real time consequences to some of these issues. You cannot talk about controlling fiscal policy if the central bank governor was actually somebody that is actually serious about um, managing our economy, this situation would not have happened. You cannot allow individuals who have, you know, you cannot allow the, the president to run the central bank as his, as his, as his private bank account. You cannot ha ha have a situation where the national treasury becomes the private uh, property of the president and his wife, where they can just go there and withdraw money like that. I mean, I have had in our investigation of why, how that's this kind of reckless control that is there, we, we try to find out. I have had conversation where the central bank is saying he's just a teller. If they bring to him a check or an order for withdrawal, he's not going to stop it. So basically these are individuals who, you know, have just become liabilities to the state. They do not care in terms of enforcing fiscal policy, enforcing uh, rules and regulations regarding uh, cash transactions, cash flows and outflows and inflows and all of that. So if in a serious country, the bank governor will have been uh, arrested by now or maybe resign his position based on these scandalous uh, revelations. The bank has not said anything. The central bank has not said anything. They haven't denied that the records we are publishing, this is the, from what I know, this is the first time the people of Sierra Leone are presented with statements of accounts, government accounts from the central bank. And in all this conversation, this bank, the administration of the central bank has remained silent. The bank governor is nowhere to be found in this conversation. When the people in the administration are, are now trying to rationalize it, it's a shame to the central bank governor, to be honest with you, because uh, we just heard from Mr. Israel who talks about uh, man banking management and banking administration. You cannot have a situation where cash withdrawals, rapid cash withdrawals are taking place that goes beyond, that violates even the, the normal banking rules of, of, of the country. And you have a bank governor that is there that's okay. And force compliance. He's just looking at it as if nothing is happening. All right. Okay. Let me move to uh, Matilda. Are you satisfied with your with, with your answer? All right. Okay. Let me move. Okay. To, so um, I I I I I saw Dr. Femi Claudius Cole's and was up. I would be interested in in hearing what she would want to um you know posit on on that um particular um question. However, I think I can leave space for others since her hand is already up. When she absolutely. takes the phone, I will be interested in hearing what she has to say. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I'm moving to Shiba, um, from Shiba to Femi, Madam Femi Claudia School of Unity Party. And also I have Dr. Nana Sise coming after Madam Femi and also um, MC. So over to you, Shiba. Hi everyone, can you all hear me? I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me guys? 
Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Go on. Great, great. So my question has a lot to do with what's been discussed from Mr. Israel and just been debated on. And it's to do with the cash withdrawals. So in Western democracies, a lot of transfers um, done by governments are done electronically. But for some reason, Sierra Leone, um, our government are using people, are uh, writing checks or issuing checks, and people are withdrawing large amounts of money, cash, literally cash. So I think my question is, it's, it's sort of been answered already, but I would just like the panel, well, all three of you, all four of you to sort of throw light, any one of you can throw light as to what could be the rationale behind that kind of amount of cash being withdrawn. So for instance, they're giving money to do this, they're giving money for projects, but everything seems to be taken out rather than staying in an account. Um, consultants are withdrawing money, you know, and that's my first question. Then there's just a, a quick second question. Um, the average Sierra Leonean um, that believes in the work of the Africanist press, who clearly, as uh, some of us on this um, Zoom meeting, is totally flabbergasted by what you've revealed to us as a team from January till now. What can we do to support the work of the Africanist press from here on? Because you've spoken, Chona, about the triangulation of evidence. So I assume there is more coming our way. What can the average Sierra Leonean, the average citizen like us do to support your work, to add value to your work? But my first question is about the cash withdrawals and why does it have to be cash? What will be the rationale behind that? Okay, thank you, Shiba. China, you wanna take it? Um, I know we talked about, uh, is Patrick, Patrick, are you? Patrick, are you there? Yes, I am. Um, I I am mentioning Patrick because I remember a couple of we were also in studying the pattern of cash withdrawals. He came up. There was something he pointed to me that I think um, made me made me think about, you know, how how government when we talk about government in terms of how we operate uh, government expenditure it, because this deals this goes beyond running an economy where um, automation you know, in financial transaction is absent in, in this case. But we're talking about the pattern of cash withdrawals and the time frames. Apart from the frequency, we notice that when you check the dates of the transactions, you see that most of these cash withdrawals, for example, by Siddiqui Jabi in the case of the um, chief minister's office that goes to 10 billion, which is $1 million in cash, there is no evidence to show why this cash is being withdrawn, why um, um, what these monies are meant for, and why the withdrawals are happening on weekends, on the last day of the working, the last working day. So why will you withdraw on Thursdays or just on Fridays? A consistent pattern of that kind of withdrawal, and you see it in the chief minister's account. The and we talk about hundreds, in some cases, hundreds of uh, millions. Then when it comes to the question of um, payments you see that repeated payments are made in, in small amounts, you know, to, for example, the furniture uh, company, AA Enterprises, you find in situations where they are paid 59,900,000, you know, to avoid the 60 threshold and some 49 million, but you have in aggregate, you will have 300 million paid into a single um, company on a single day. So why not pay? the entire amount um, on the very day is because they are trying to look at, they are trying to exploit or use legal mechanisms. This, this goes to the innovative mechanism developed by the state to steal public money in the name of procurement, in the name of uh, impressed expenditure and all of these things. So um, there's no way, we have been waiting for an explanation from government regarding how they can rationalize this kind of uh, withdrawals that violate not just the banking rules, but also procurement regulations. So there's a whole chain of irregularities 
that you might find running through. If you aggregate, uh, we are talking about colleagues to see how we can do um, the aggregation of cash withdrawals alone between all these ministries, how much are, have we lost in cash taken out by individuals? Not money paid to companies in smaller amounts, but this is like someone, check is written in the name of Siddiqui Jabi who goes to the bank today to collect 200 million. Tomorrow, one, uh, 50 million. So nobody explains, there's no explanation why this individual is doing this withdrawal. That's not how you run government. There are finance officers in government. There are, you know, there are ways you do expenditure, retirements, impressed retirements, and 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 notes, no transaction notes to explain. So this is why I think the bank governor himself uh, owes the people of Sierra Leone explanation. So we have to put pressure on uh, political leaders and members of parliament, a greater member of civil society, to take this conversation to the next stage, which is what Sierra Leoneans. Uh, perhaps might do this information, ask your MPs to invite these finance officers from the Minister of Finance, the Bank Governor, the Accountant General's Department, and the Secretary to the President to explain how these kinds of situations happen. You cannot just say it's a normal way of doing business, that my office can use money. How can you waste such public money? How can you explain Musa Jajua going to the Bank of Sierra Leone to withdraw 300 million on, in the name of the President? What did you do with that kind of money on a single day? And the following day, you see this happening repeatedly. It's like even a, a, an individual owning a private bank account will not do that kind of uh, withdrawal from your own money in, in that rapid fashion. And these monies are not even retired into the bank as well because there are rules in terms of how you use public money on, okay. uh, on some of these things. So, but um, we are, yes, I think Patrick is on now. We mentioned, I, I was just making reference to our discussion uh, a couple of days ago regarding the pattern of ca cash withdrawals, why you felt it was important to highlight it when it came to the office of the president. Uh, thank you, Chairman. This is Patrick, and you have actually made an elaborate response and uh, a justification towards that. Uh, but I would want to say that um, one of the things that have been highlighted is that um, in order to reduce corruption in the continent, uh, countries should promote cashless transactions. It is pretty clear that uh, one of the reasons why corrupt uh, people would want to use cash is that it is impossible to trace it once it leaves the bank. And that means that uh, you curtail uh, the process of tracing that. And that is why even the anti-corruption uh, in many of the African countries really cannot trace the money and what the money does. Uh, so in order to uh, be able to uh, you know, curb this kind of massive withdrawals, there must be a rigorous fiscal policy that controls what amount of money uh, can be withdrawn and what cannot be withdrawn. I, I know that in Kenya, there has been a time when the government said that they were going to withdraw a certain denomination from the market in order to force people who are keeping money in their houses to take the money to the bank. But still you realize that that one is inadequate because people have a way of laundering money if the Kenyan government is withdrawing certain denominations, then they quickly go and change the local denomination into a dollar bill in order for them to be able to transact anytime. So the cash withdrawal has become a phenomenon where corruption is ripe. Uh, in most cases in Kenya where corruption has been highlighted, you've had of small individuals are uh, being sent to the bank by um, influential people to withdraw money that is being carried in sacks and goes into people's houses. The thing is that you cannot, you cannot trace the very final end where that money goes to. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Patrick, for throwing lights um, on this question. Femi, um, we're gonna go to you, Femi, and uh, Dr. Sise and MC. Um, from MC, we go to Gifty. So you guys, please be patient with one another. Over to you, uh, Madam Femi from the Unity Party. Yeah, um, I really want to say a very big thank you to the entire African Express. Um, the work they are doing is invaluable. Um, a lot of us in Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone right now is so polarized. You have those that are simply clapping and praising 
They're not really looking and really assessing. And what the Africanist press has done uh, has, has been to really highlight that this is happening in real time. This level of corruption is happening from the top. It is of concern and it will definitely hamper our growth. And it is also hampering our political space. The entire political space has been contaminated. Um, I, I'm listening to um, somebody making such a good input here. And uh, Mr. Augustine Navo is using a terminology that's even inappropriately being used for somebody who's raising a valid point. Um, can you please, uh, sorry, can you please, uh, I'm sorry, I have to do it. Um, I'm talking to my technical person. Can you please remove um, Augustine Navo from this forum? If you cannot have a civil discussion, then we might have to remove you from this forum. Thank you, Femi. Yes, uh, and she's making a valid contribution. All this money is going down a black hole. And those in government know that it's going down a black hole. And the rest of the population, she's talking about the doctor who was ill. There are so many cases there are so many cases of people who cannot, yes, somebody broke a leg the other day. Rather than go to Connaught, they took them up country to cure it using herbs. And I'm like, why? Why wouldn't you go to Connaught Hospital? He says the last person who went to Connaught, the foot became totally rotten. So we have a hospital that has nothing, that has nothing. There's no respect for the doctors. There's no cleaning in the hospital. There's no sanitation. There's no investment. And one first family is spending the country's money with impunity. They are using the country's money as if it's their personal bank account, which is unacceptable. And the only way forward, somebody is asking what can they do to help the African press? Spread the word. We have to all spread the message and none of us should be shy about calling stealing for stealing. This is stealing the people's money. The people are poor. The people are dirt poor. The number of people who sleep in the streets that have no future. It is disgusting. It is unacceptable to, for one set of people to spend this kind of money with impunity. And we all sit back. We all acting as if this is okay. No, it's not okay. The Africanist press has done us the favor of highlighting. As political leaders, what do we do with this information? We cannot roll over and pretend as if it's not happening. We have to call them out. They have to know that we now know. And what does this government want to do? They want to vilify the attorney, the, the, the head of, uh, uh, it is, it, it's so maddening. But I think until every Sierra Leonean at home and abroad gets mad until we're all mad are we going to finally see changes and you're not then going to vilify vilify the mayor vilify Lara Taylor Pierce and all because you don't want to hear the message and the message is that we have trusted you with our money we have trusted you with our country and you guys are messing up you're using it as a private personal bank account I say thank you so much to the Africanist press and for people like us, we are not going to sit on that information. We had a meeting today with the MPs. What are we doing with this information? Are there questions being answered? As for the ACC- So, Madam Femi, can I ask you something? Can I ask you something? I know you are basically trying to, to, to make uh, um, some observations and comments here. So as a uh, head of a political party, what is the way forward with all of these evidences um, and of investigation by the African Express. What is the way forward? I think we, we've, we've elected a monster, quite frankly. What we have now with the SLPP government is a huge, selfish, <laughs> a monster. And what we look at, what are the alternatives? What are our alternatives moving forward? What chance do we have in Sierra Leone? We thought this was gonna be change. Really, they have so many books that are being cooked. They're planning on a census that they're not prepared for. They have $6 million they're planning on wasting. They're planning on a decentralization policy to tip the scale. 
the SLPP has their hand on the scale. They want to tip it in such a way that we end up with something so close to a one party government where nobody will ask them any questions. And they do not feel that even the SEC, I ask them, the, the, are you going to investigate corruption that's happening under your nose in real time? This is happening in real time. What more evidence do we need? So, and we have a president who is very laissez-faire. Even on a public stage, he's being asked questions and he's flippant, totally flippant. So Sierra Leonean people at home and abroad, we need to ask the questions. When we vote, what on earth are we thinking? What is our screen? What is our filter for who we're putting in charge of our money, our lives, our children's lives, our future? They're planning all these big pie in the sky ideas, but they're not taking care of the basics. Okay. They're not taking care of the basics. I think that, that has been, that has been uh, um, most people concerned. That has been our concern as well. And uh, Cherno, before we go to Dr. Nana, Dr. Nana, please, can you get ready? Uh, Cherno, do you want to quickly, you know, just tip on what um, Madam Femi has just highlighted? Yeah, I, I think um, that is the question here. We, we have to ask, um, I, I, I have to put myself in the situation because apart from my other colleagues, I have a personal attachment to the situation which, because I'm a Sierra Leonean. Yes. And, and a part of the thing is I feel obligated to um, participate in a conversation that is designed to move the country from where it is. That's the essence of why I am committed to doing what we're doing right now. And I also want to thank um, my colleagues who are non Sierra Leoneans who see it appropriate to um, be involved in a work like this to highlight, especially to help us highlight to the global community, including our people in Sierra Leone, what is happening uh, to the national revenues that we should be using to undertake sectoral development. I am, I believe that this information um, will definitely has created a significant impact. You can see it yep. from the anger that it has caused among uh, state officials, among their supporters. But um, the, the good thing here is that nobody, with, no matter how angry they are, has been able to identify what they might think or what will come closer to anything they will say is a lie. So we haven't published, which is, which is why we found it necessary to make sure that anything that we publish has to be supported with incontrovertible evidence. Okay, and we are committed. What the only thing I would tell Madam Femi and the other individuals, leaders, whether they're community leaders, political leaders, or faith based leaders, uh, or every citizen, is that we are committed to producing more evidence of this graft, including showing exactly where these monies have the gone point. to. Yes, where they are, because in the final analysis, it's the own people's money, it's our money, yes. it's money that is going to be used for the development of our country. Some of this money is also loans, like Patrick mentioned. They are from multilateral loans from the IMF and what, but that this government is completely still in a way. Those yep. debts are going to be inherited by our own kids, future generations. We have to make sure that we do our own part as citizens to ensure that these kinds of ways of running government is stopped. And we I'm have stopped. to do that by exposing these things and having a yes. conversation on it. All right, thank you very much, uh, uh, um, Femi, for your concern, and uh, thank you, um, Cherno, for responding to that. Um, Dr. Nana, are you ready for? Are you ready for me? Are you ready to ask your question, Dr. Nana? Doctor. Yes. Dr. Nana, can you please turn the camera? Can you please switch the camera? Oh, well, hold on. Can you, yes, switch the camera to selfie? No, oh. to selfie, yes. Oh my gosh. It was working well. What happened? I don't know what happened. It was working. All right, okay. We got you now. Go ahead. All right. So um, just yesterday, and this, first of all, let me thank the panel for taking their time 
um, to do what they are doing. This, this is incredible. This has never happened as far as I know in the history of Sierra Leone for people to come up with such detailed information, investigating the government, the, the, the actual government um, at hand. So this is incredible. Uh, my question is, comment first. Just yesterday, I was watching a YouTube video that describes Sierra Leone as one of the poorest 10 countries in Africa. In addition, Sierra Leone is now in a more impoverished state than I've ever experienced in my lifetime. And I've been, I've been in the world for some time now. Given the fact that the first lady has admitted um, to the Africanist press accusation on, that, on social media, that makes their reports more credible. The question I have now is, how can the citizen of Sierra Leone, or can the citizen of Sierra Leone, or will they be able to take a class action lawsuit to retrieve these monies that have been stolen from Sierra Leone? If yes, how can they go about it? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nana. Do you want a response to that? Yes, yes, um, Cherno. Okay, the, I, I think um, that question is important, especially because we, we have seen how much money was spent on supposedly holding um, members of the previous administration accountable for their stewardship or the, the, to, to account for their time in power over the last 10 years before uh, Bio and the SLPP came to power. I know that um, because of the nature of the kind of judicial system that we have, where justice in itself, they, they could, a few days ago, the president was asked about the lack of independence of the judiciary and the acts, lack of access to justice. He said he was not given justice when he was, when he was an opposition politician. So it means things are not going to change. But um, I think that uh, people have power. They can determine the continuation of this situation or the non-continuation of this situation. I think sufficient political education and information will help the people to discover for themselves what they have to do first and foremost to prevent the ongoing continuation or the continuation of this kind of uh, way of running government. Now, what are we going to do regarding the retrieving of, of monies? We have to identify where these monies are located. Uh, very recently, I saw action by the people of Nigeria or the state of Nigeria for the return of funds that were supposedly taken out of the country by the Abacha regime. Various governments all across the world, uh, especially Africa, are now uh, collaborating with international organizations, even foreign governments, to retrieve monies that are taken out. But the sad thing here is that much of the money that's been taken out of Sierra Leone is taken to uh, offshore destinations, to even Asian countries, where perhaps uh, international regulations will be difficult to implement. So, but what stands between the people of Sierra Leone and justice right now is the continuation of is the fact that these people who we are talking about have power. The president just said his wife hasn't done anything without even allowing an independent investigation. So what do you expect? No court is going to convict the first lady. So we hope that the people of Sierra Leone will be armed with this information and be able to use the electoral process in a much more effective way as part of the process of, of reclaiming their power and also finding ways to retrieve the monies. We are committed to showing where these monies are going, which is what we are doing. And we appreciate the public response and the, and the kind of conversation that this has generated, which, steam, which energizes us to do more, to do more, to, to keep tracking these missing, missing billions, as we keep calling them. Okay, we uh, thank you very much, um, Chairman, for thro also throwing lights on that um, question from Dr. Nana. Um, I'm going to Gifty, MC, Farella, and Jobsina. Gifty, I start with you. Um, thank you, Rachel. Um, first of all, before I ask my question, um, please, if you have to do this again, can you just please make sure it is strictly arranged? Because this is so unfair and unacceptable. For pe or people are so many in this program and they are just using all sorts of abusive language. It's so unfair. 
We have so many respectable people in this panel, in this forum, and they, are, they don't even care. So please, um, Rachel, for the next time, make sure you reshuffle. Okay, make thank sure you, don't it. Access to everyone, please. They can not only be viewers, but they don't, can't have access to the, to the live. Okay, now I'll ask my question. I am sure you know this question is for you. Um, talking about all this misfunding, public funding, We've been hearing you talking now and you've given all the details, given us evidences. Now my question is, do we really have stakeholders or parliamentarians that are, that are really in those positions that involve all these monetary issues? Why I ask is this, because from the look of things, what I noticed is it's like they are like the, 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 the cow and then Madabio has the rope. Like when they said, you hold the cow, I hold the rope. I can just pull them anytime, anytime I want. You understand, drawing them, controlling them. So are these stakeholders, are, do we really have them? Because if yes, then are they playing their role as stakeholders or parliamentarians or what? Because I don't think so. Because if they are playing their roles as parliamentarians or stakeholders, then all this misfunding issues shouldn't be happening. Because they have to say yes or no. They can't allow Mother Bio and the wife to be withdrawing money in and out just like they want without any legal thing to show for it. If no, then why are they there? Why are they holding the position that they know they cannot put, they cannot um, uh, um, act on? Okay. So please tell me. Thank you very much, uh, Gifty. Cherno. The question is for you. Well, I, 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 I hope we all come from constituencies where we have members of parliament and I'm glad, I think, uh, was it Mr. Ahmed Sisir, right? Who um, said he represents the All People's Congress. There is Madam uh, Femi Claudius Cole. Um, these are political leaders who, whose voices um, can be, uh, who can use their position to also convey um, to their colleagues, politicians who are active on building the kind of uh, public pressure that we need to demand answers to some of these questions. And also, for example, the Anti-Corruption Commission has promised the people of Sierra Leone an investigation. And now, without reporting the details of that investigation, whether the investigation is ongoing, how far they are, what they've done with the investigation, they are on record to deny um, to defend the chief minister and also the president has himself come out to defend his wife and defend the individuals who are so named. So the question is what will opposition political parties who are stakeholders in this process do? What will civil society organizations do? What will media institutions do? For example, why has uh, a greater sector of the media uh, refused to participate in this kind of conversation? What can be done? Um, uh, they try, they have a conversation, you will find uh, radio stations and TV stations hosting individuals from government to talk about what we have published without making an effort to uh, hear our own voices, those individuals who have raised these issues and brought them to the forefront. When did we get to this point in the country when the, uh, the media, a greater sector of the media appears to be uh, uh, compliant or spectators to what is ongoing? There are exceptional cases we've seen independent newspapers uh, doing their best. We can't single out uh, the Standard Times, which has been running uh, on their front pages every publication we've, we've, we've published. We can also say the same thing about Star Radio. We can say, to some extent, um, Awareness Times and all some of some effort. But this is um, the nationalist. But these are basically few in number compared to the larger amount of uh, newspapers and radio stations that we have that cannot touch this issue. Is it as a result of the climate of repression? Is it as a result of the, the state capture of the civic landscape where civil society organizations and the media and even politicians cannot uh, generally come out? Or is it as a result of the, the scale of violence so this is why corruption, um, when governments become extremely corrupt, they become extremely violent, they become characteristically repressive, just as Dr. Barry said earlier. So this is where okay. the nexus between 
corruption and uh, uh, civil liberties and human rights um, come in. So we have to um, pose these questions to our MPs and encourage them to take on these, these serious issues because that's what the parliament is all about. That's what parliament is for, the bar association, the civil, you know, all these organizations. But we are in a difficult place in Sierra Leone, um, is, is what uh, Madam Cole said, is we are faced with a monstrous situation, not just a monster, but a, a monstrous situation, a climate that I have not seen for the last 20 years, writing and being active in Sierra Leone. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Cherno. So um, over to you, I have MC Farella, Jobsina and Florence. Please, those, these are just the four uh, people we're gonna take your questions because we're gonna round up in the next 15 minutes, please. So um, MC, over to you. Uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, as my sister has already introduced me as MC, uh, I stay in the UK. My question is to Cherno. Cherno, please. Uh, as a Sierra Leonean, with all your publication that you're putting on, on social media or another platform, please, I just want to ask, have you ever taken your time to hand over these papers to the anti-corruption? Because why I'm saying this is like the anti-corruption is saying everything that you are, you, you are, public, you are putting on uh, the public is fake, is lies. So I just want to know, as a Sierra Leonean, what do you think you're going to do for the people of Sierra Leone? As, as, because let me tell you, at, at the moment, I'm pissed off because today I'm one of the victims in Sierra Leone because my younger brother, unfortunately, uh, his son gets healed and then probably they call me around this four in the morning, ask them to take the son to the hospital. Just imagine, as a citizen of Sierra Leone, all the hospital my brother been, they say the doctors are on strike. So I just want to know exactly what is going on. As a, as a journalist, what are you going to do for the people of Sierra Leone? That's okay. my question to you. Thank you very much, um, Cherno. Um, this is what we talk about when we say, how corruption affects our human rights. So um, the question is for you, Cherno, and um, Dr. Barry can throw light on that as well when it comes to how corruption affects our human rights, just as uh, MC um, just mentioned. Well, I don't know if Dr. Barry is there, um, if he can take on the, the human, human rights rights aspect. Yeah. Um, Dr. Yeah. Barry is... Um, well, you can go on with the question and probably we'll catch up with you. Well, I, I um, what, what is it that we can do? Um, we, we are basically doing what we are doing, um, providing the information, the evidence as it is. In the past, I have said, I think it was on Sarah Gem and a couple of other platforms in which I said, we are willing <clears throat> to uh, assist in the fight against corruption, including the um, assigning of people who are not even Sierra Leoneans who can assist the Anti-Corruption Commission if they need the expertise to investigate some of the issues we've highlighted. If they need the evidence, we can also provide. In fact, the evidence is now with the public. Every citizen in Sierra Leone can now access these materials from the African Express website. It's a, it's a repository of evidence now where you can, you can take the bank statements for yourself, you can take other correspondence and look at it and draw out your own um, conclusion. I think I'm encouraged by the contribution from Mr. Israel, who is telling me that he is drawing out, he's looking at his own a kind of pattern. That's like studying the evidence on his, on his, his own terms, which is what we want. So um, that is, I think, um, the role of the journalist to inform, to hold government accountable, to expose, to bring to the knowledge of the public what the the state is doing behind the scenes. So are you willing? Are you willing to work with anti-corruption on this no, investigation? Not, not willing. We have offered the expertise. We have done. We have done everything that is required of the anti-corruption commission to do. It's upon them okay. to do with the evidence. But if they need assistance, we can send our people on our own expense, not even on the expense of the state. They cannot even. We don't even want them to buy a bottle of water for any of our people, as long as they can guarantee their safety and security. But looking at the comments, 
somebody just insulted one of our uh, director of publications. So that tells you the level of anger and and raises a fundamental question about security. These are not funny issues because. So what? So what was the response, or what is the response so of anti-corruption? The anti -corruption? So this is the thing. It's the same thing that we've had from the president. The same thing. The president just said our publications are frivolous. The anti-corruption said the same thing, and they tend to say somebody. I think just wrote that uh, uh, we are not wishful blowers. We are not wishful blowers. We are researchers, academics, and journalists. A journalist is different from a wishful blower. A wishful blower is somebody that walks in uh, that blows the whistle regarding what is happening. You you might have a government employee who is dissatisfied. They speak about like what Tawa did. Ibrahim Tawa Conte whistle blowed on Parliament. He's part of Parliament, but he whistle blowed on Parliament. The journalists investigate what's happening and report it. That's what we're doing. Okay, then we are holding or write a book about what is happening, investigate, write a book, and explain. That's the role of people do it all over the place. The role of the academic, the role of the journalist, the role of the citizen is to hold government accountable, to demand answers for the use of public money, how government functions. Government is to serve people, it is not to just lord over people. We have to understand the responsibility of the state. To his citizens. Once we know that, then we'll be able to know exactly what we need to do. Each one of us. It's not just about what I have to do. It's about what we can do individually as citizens and collectively as a country to find out and search for the kind of leadership that we need that can resolve the, the uh, problems that we've been grappling with. We talk about 60 years of uh, okay. independence. So are we satisfied with the kind of situation that we have? Yeah, we'll, have to, we'll have, have to get to that. We'll have to get to that at the end of this uh, um, discussion, this panel discussion, as moving forward, what as a citizen, what can we do moving forward? Uh, what, what kind of help does uh, the African Express need um, from citizens of Sierra Leone? We need all those um, 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 answers um, today and let's keep the conversation going. I'm gonna to move to Farella and uh, Jobsina, um, Florence and Dolly, and that's it. Please, let's keep it short. We, we, we don't have much time, okay? All right, thank you very much. Farella, over to you. Thank you, HR, thanks for the invite. Good evening all. Special thank you to the Africanist press team. You guys are amazing. You are God sent. You don't know what you've done for some of us. Without you, we would have never known all these figures. We used to hear rumors, but now we have, for me, we have evidence from you guys. I know they are asking for evidence, but the evidence is here. You've given the evidences. And in Sierra Leone, we are aware that they can get some of these evidences if they want it. The SEC boss can have it if he wants it, but we know he can't use it. He hasn't got the power. He'll be out of there if he uses it. I want to ask a couple of questions to the team. I know holding the government accountable by the citizens, when would that be? Would that only be after the SLPP is out of state house. What can we do now, even as diasporas, apart from shouting, screaming, writing on social media, engaging, which is good, because we know they are sending people after us to know what's going on. So they are getting our messages. But apart from that, what else can we do is there a petition that we can all sign? What can we do? We, we, we are anxious. We need to do more. We need to do more. We can't just sit down. We have all these evidences and we're shouting and screaming. We need to do something. We need this to stop. We can't just sit down here. They will continue using all these monies. Mm -hmm maltreating our people until when? And one thing I am so anxious about, Sierra Leoneans are easy to forget. The, I don't understand our ideology. By the time it gets to the election time, 
Maybe some of us will be hoping that they'll come out of state house. Who knows? Who knows if we don't get going and exhaust all avenues, these people will win the election again and will be back here, will be on our pages shouting and screaming and they'll continue to abuse us and still get away with all these monies. We need answers. We need help from people like you. Where do we go from here? Because some of us, our hands are tied. We don't have the information. We are just here like lap dogs waiting for you people to give us food. You need to help us by telling us what can we do now? Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Question. Just a minute, Rachel. My second question for you, especially Professor Chernoba, I have to give you the gown. I have given you a professor. You are a professor now in my eyes. <laughs> professor Chernoba, we have heard of the NGOs, international NGOs mm -hmm. that are going to Sierra Leone that they are part of corruption too in Sierra Leone. Have you got any evidence on them, please? Can you expose them for us? Sierra Leoneans, their own corrupt practices, we know and we are disappointed in them. But the international NGOs as well that are corrupt and getting involved in corruption, we need to expose them to if you have anything on them, please, sir. God bless All right. you. All right, um, thank you very much, um, Faila. Cherno, this is what um, almost everybody is saying. What can we do now that the momentum is here, you know, before we get exhausted and, uh, you know, Serenians, because we quit for forget, Salon people, we quit for forget and move on. So this is our fear. What do we do from this point? So Farela is asking if there's any petition that Serenians can sign or what are the mechanism? What are the mechanism that we can put together as Serenians to ensure that these people, these perpetrators are brought to book? Um, so over to you, Cherno. Uh, I, I will not have a, a single answer to that question. So that's a national question. What are we going to do collectively as citizens with what we now know? Um, is happening. A couple of things could be, I remember when we were talking about the Pademba Road massacre, for example, the killing of prisoners, I had suggested in a conversation that uh, petitions can be written to organizations that are funding Sierra Leone and asking them that they should make as a condition for their ongoing funding. For example, DFID is a leading con multilateral contributor to the security sector in Sierra Leone. You, if you are concerned about police brutality, you can ask the British Department for International Development not to make it as a condition that in order for them to continuously fund the government of Sierra Leone security sector, they have to ensure that uh, the police or the security services respect human rights in order for the IMF and the World Bank or all these agencies that are engaging with Sierra Leone and giving them more debts or grants or whatever it is, um, they have to make it a condition of their engagement with the government of Sierra Leone that these evidences of corruption are responded to. I have said one of the reasons why international organizations have been able, have been scoring the government of Sierra Leone or this current government so highly in their indices is because um, there has been a collaborative effort from the government and its agents in the private media and the civil society to cover up this real time corruption. So now there's an increase in demand, even that I know of from international partners that are now putting pressure, asking questions, asking for answers the same way we're asking. So I believe that when citizens' voices become louder and become more amplified and more seriously engaged in demanding these questions, leaders will have no, no choice but to come out. We, we are being told that the president of Sierra Leone came out to talk about his third year anniversary, to talk about his achievement in these two years. No, he came out simply because we have inundated the state with these evidence of his own graft, his own financial crimes, that they have no, nothing to do but to respond to it. The first response was to ignore. 
what the African Express was publishing to pretend it's just social media talk. And they got a greater sector of the media to not to engage with what we're doing, which is still what is happening. So we have been able to undercut the state's monopoly of information by the use of uh, new media, like what we're doing now, which is what makes this virtual town hall conversation so important as hostile as one or two people might be, but it's so critical because we are able to engage on a planetary scale. This is a global conversation because you, you have people here from Sierra Leone, people from Europe, people from Gambia, people from Kenya. We all engage in a single conversation. It's no small thing. 20 years ago, this would have been impossible. And now imagine if we never had this opportunity to have this conversation about what is happening in our country. And now we have to depend on the media that's back home to do this conversation. It would have been impossible to have this conversation. So I think we are already doing what we are supposed to do to resolve the situation, which is what, which is providing information, having a conversation on information. And the people who are engaged in this conversation, I know they are all stakeholders. You, Rachel, is a stakeholder in the media, talk host. Um, the, we have a political party leader, political party representatives, academics, people who represent various sectors of the Salonian public are here. So I would say that we've gotten to this point in a year. It has taken us 13 months. We started our publication on March 1, 2020. Today is April 17. What have we achieved? We've been able to generate a national and international conversation around ongoing corruption in Sierra Leone, which was absent in the, in the narrative on corruption. What we have witnessed before now, before we got to this point, was a single narrative advanced by the state and popularized by okay. media. So we should not underestimate what we are doing. Let us amplify what we are doing. And I believe we are slowly or increasingly getting the attention of the international community because we live in a global community. Every decent government organization or individual will not tolerate what is happening in Sierra Leone or this kind of development, even if it's happening in the United States or any other place. It's, it's, it's unacceptable. Right, Fyla, I also to, mentioned about an NGO, an international NGO. Yeah. Yeah, um, I have talked about this in the past. I will encourage you to read um, the book on Ebola, which I wrote is titled uh, Rogue Politicians, Corporate Gangsters and Multinationals. So there are also international organizations that are committed to ending graft. There are international people who are, we have an international panel here. Uh, somebody from the United States, myself from Sierra Leone, somebody from Gambia, somebody from Kenya. It's an international panel. So. They are also, the state has its own international alliances. Citizens must be able to build networks across borders because in the final analysis, our friends and our allies outside of Sierra Leone will also help to encourage people who are not aware of the, what is happening because the state is covering up its own crimes. It's covering up its own, they're spending money to make sure this conversation does not get out to the public. And we are working hard with almost nothing except our skills and our expertise and these tools of new media, the tools of mass communication in our disposal, with new technology to be able to get to the people, to be able to educate oh. people, so that's power. So I think let us look at the, the impact of what we have done and how far this has taken us. We have people from Australia, people from Europe, people from the United States, people from Africa, having a conversation, it's no small thing. Let's increase oh. it. All right, thank you, Chair. Now, uh, we have um, um, one one message and uh, one, okay, we have Jobsina. Jobsina, um, this should be our final uh, question for today as we are going to wrap up shortly. Jobsina, over to you. Uh, um, let me first of all thank Chair and the team for the incredible job that they're doing and uh, we all know that corruption undermines um, democratic institutions. And um, um, uh, first of all, let me also thank all the panelists for speaking to the issues, corruption issues. I'm gonna be talking outside the context of corruption. I'm gonna actually bring in the people who are lost in translation and the people who are the unforgotten people who are the women of that country. We know that, um, I mean, Research has proven that um, women are less corrupt. And that, um, you know, women in Sierra Leone are very unrepresentative 
of um, of um, critical decision making positions and also you know position of power. We're going to be 60 years this year, and men have been at the helm of politics, helm of affairs, and uh, we are in this predicament that we find ourselves. Women are the pillars of communities. They are the strength of communities. They build the mortar and brick to communities. We all are aware. And uh, recently, we actually um, came to realize that the key tenets or principle of democracy, which is accountability. We had a woman who was the audit, auditor general who was the one that was transparent in that fight. And research has also proven that when men are together, they collude, they gang up. We've seen them gang up in terms of the legislature. We have all these people, men who are the helm of political parties who refuse to hold Marabio accountable. They shut up, there would be mafia, gang up, criminal cartel, they wouldn't say nothing. But you see women like the mayor, women who are very ardent supporters who would actually stick up together. If women are going to be serious, they are sober, they will do work, they will do thorough, thorough work through and through. And research has proven that. And my question is maybe to Claudia Skoll, Dr. Claudia Skoll, and maybe um, Cherno, we have spoken one-to-one, -one, and I asked you on your view on women leadership. Women leadership and women talent is what is missing here. The more women we have in position of, position of power and assuming power and critical decision-making positions across public service, across government, I believe we will be able to alleviate poverty and alleviate corruption. So Chairman, what's your view on women leadership in terms of alleviating corruption? And also, Claudia Cole, I put that to you in terms of uh, alleviating corruption, alleviating poverty, reducing poverty into two, and all the cross-cutting issues that affect women. Because women, are, um, you know, when it comes to um, poverty, women carry the face of poverty. And women carry the brunt of poverty. They carry the brunt of childcare. When it gets into the country, the plight of poverty, you see it, the women carry it. You see children, you know, unkept children, mal malnourished children. So all these cross-cutting issues of teenage pregnancy, rape, you know, affects women. I mean, children and girls. So I'm going to put this question to um, to, to Cherno, and also panelists, anybody who is actually going to be able to speak to these issues, and also Dr. Claudia Cole, who I, I, I have a lot of admiration for you. I respect you. In as much as they say women don't support other women, and uh, you will be hanging in the balance, I believe that uh, women represent, you know, the face of poverty and represent the women's issues, we should be supporting other women who are actually out there representing tall. So what's your view, anyway, to cut a long story short, what's your view on uh, women in numbers getting equally, who are lost in translation, to have the balance, to get into position of power, to assume in critical decision-making roles, to be finance ministers, you know, at the forefront of politics. Uh, you thank think you very much. Thank you very much, Jobsina. Um, Ma Madam Femi, you can take on this question. Yes, I think that one thing that has been sorely missing from politics in Sierra Leone has been women, women's involvement. And we even see where we have women who are performing, women who are really doing an excellent job, being undermined, being disregarded, trying to be victimized. I think what we will see in the coming years, because 5050 is doing a lot of work, a lot of associations, women's associations are doing a lot of work. We're trying to encourage, even in my political party, we're trying to encourage a lot of women to actually actively participate and contest for seats. Um, culturally, a lot of the times you will engage the woman and the woman will, you know, bring forth her husband, say, you know, let the man. But I'm seeing changes. I'm seeing a lot of changes. So we're hoping that, and we're having women who are blazing the trail. But I think that on the whole, I don't know, China, whether you will agree with me that women, I think, are more transparent, 
I have more of a conscience when it comes to um, to corruption. I think, and quite frankly, we've tried the men for the best part of 60 years. I think it is time we turn it over to women and see how best women can be able, but there are going to be a lot more women contesting the next election. That much I can tell you for free, that a lot of women are now coming on board. Before, as you say, women were not supporting other women. Now I'm actually having women come into my party office, actually taking membership, actually becoming active. So I think that it is our time. I think it's, you know, we have to step out of traditional roles and step into, into governance. Those who are there are doing excellent jobs. Even the women MPs are doing a fantastic job. So I think the more women and those who can encourage their sisters, their cousins, their aunts to, 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 to come on board. And we are trying to actually get rid of women's leadership, those kind of things. We just want women to lead. Women chairperson, not just women's leader, it is for cook, it is for dance. The we women's swing, women. the women's swing. We don't want wings anymore. We don't want wings. We want to be the main item. We want to be the icing on the cake now. We don't want for be wings anymore. But we're going to see a difference. Mark, mark my word. We're going to see a difference. All right. Um, I'm going to just say, uh, look, um, look, we don't have time now because let me tell you, this conversation is ongoing. We're going to have more of this conversation from time to time that we can talk about or deal with issues affecting uh, um, women and affecting Sierra Leone as a country. So let's keep it short. In the next five minutes and a minute, we're going to wrap up. So Florence, I'll give you the podium to talk. Make your question very brief. And Dolly, please make your question very uh, brief. Five minutes, we're going to wrap up. Can you unmute? Um, okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Rachel and the panelists. I just want to make two comments where uh, probably link it directly to Cherno. As a whistleblower, we saw from the 2019 audit report where it stated clearly that the office of the first lady do not have the competent expertise to handle the type of finances they're given. And um, it has been very glaring that when you came up with this allegation of corruption, we saw an overwhelming support from the institutions that should be guarding us in terms of leakages, the anti-corruption, the procurement unit, you know, the president, everybody shouting and protecting her. Do you think that with that backing that she's having, and um, we've seen for the first time an office having funds illegally, because I say illegally, we all know by our constitution, you have to go through the parliament. And I was previewed to work at that office when it all started. I knew we never had funds from the consolidated fund. The only thing that was supported was our travel and um, other um, things that First Lady was doing apart from her projects. So with that backing, do you think our monies will still be at risk with all of the justification made by the Ministry of Finance. The second thing is, as a journalist, we've seen a trend wherein so-called civil society activists have become in favoritism or working for different political parties, most of which are either the APT or the SLPP, and the hiding and in fact, it has, it has reached to the point where in even the duty bearers, our colleague journalists, we've seen them, you know, being either supporting the SLPP or the APC. How do you think 
it affects or the 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 spirit of your work, especially when it comes to professionals that you think should hold the country or those in authority in accountable, being now, you know, working or let me say dancing in their tune. Yes, those are very, very important questions. I don't know if I should answer or we take the last question so we can just- Okay, keep... let's take the last one and you close from there because we don't have time. Dolly, can you please uh, um, ask your questions very brief, please? <laughs> I know Rachel will be very brief because um, first of all, I'm gonna say, Thanks to the Afghan Express team for, for their good and tremendous job they are doing for us because um, they have unveiled a lot of things that we would have never been able to know. And all the questions I wanted to ask, everybody has asked the question. I just want to say thank you. And we hope that all this job will not go in vain because the monies are so much that if you can find a way or any way that all of us can come together, how we can get back this money, because those monies, we need those monies. Even if we have another government, these governments have to go. We need those monies because these monies are, just, they are so huge. They can do a lot of things for us. So we just want to hope that we can able to retrieve these monies back. To retrieve the monies, okay. Thank you very much for your contribution. Um, Dali. So, um, China, you're going to answer the question and we close from here. Yes, I want to thank um, you and everyone, especially my, our colleagues who have uh, taken part in this uh, serious conversation. It's such a dealing with um, living issues like this, things that have to do with lives and uh, people's interest at stake and all of that is, is such a complex thing. So I want to thank them. Uh, Patrick and uh, Dr. Barry and uh, Professor Wallace for um, making time. Before I say that, I want to assure Madam Cole that I support women's leadership. I have had great experience working with great women, including uh, Professor Wallace here, who has diligently edited all our work and looked at looked at uh, every bit of the investigation that we we write and submit to her. She, you know, she's always available to make sure that we get we get we get out every Sunday. So if we're getting out every every Sunday. She's a critical component of, of that. I want to underline that, and uh, I want to thank you in front of every Salonian that's watching us. Um, we appreciate that work, and the. Regarding uh, the illegality with the use of public funds, we're still tracking that. We still, it's an ongoing process. I will assure you that we've noticed some changing patterns in terms of how they, they use money. Um, like for example, the last two international trips that the president took, one to Guinea, the, he used to withdraw money from the local and overseas travel account. He did it differently. I will not say it now because we're still observing that. So. We also have been able to track some monies that are hidden in some accounts in Sierra Leone that we intend to publish by May. So this will give us, but some, the government is not trying to address the corruption. They are trying to make sure the information does not get out. So that's why they're harassing the audit service. They're harassing every individual. They've dismissed people from the Ministry of Finance, the Bank of Sierra Leone. They've been arresting people secretly and taking them to the CID to threaten them, thinking that these individuals are the sources of our information. So what the government is concerned about at this stage is to trace the source of the African Express investigation, the source of our information, to make sure they close what they call, close the leakages of the source by trying to identify individuals. They've been able to, they have been unable to do that. Why? It's because they, don't, they want to continue with, with, with stealing public money. Because if you are not concerned about hiding your method of stealing, you will not be concerned about trying to arrest people who you suspect are the conveyors of your evidence of theft. So they've attacked the public, the Auditor General unfairly, thinking that the Auditor General is working in collaboration. They're no, not even thinking. They've accused her in their party newspapers. They've even called for her dismissal. 
So they have arrested and dismissed other people from the Minister of Finance. That started since last year to now. The Minister of Finance ordering the arrest of people. But I will assure you, the people of Sierra Leone, that we are tracking these evidences of information and we will continue to expose every information that's available in our possession. And what will that do? Perhaps it will make sure that governments are careful in terms of how they, they steal money. Already, they now discover that their innovative skill and pattern of stealing money by hiding it has been uncovered by the African Express. They are now working to develop a new method, and which is also what we are tracking, we are tracing. So we are exposing both what we've investigated, we're also investigating what they are trying to do to continue this theft of public money. So that's what I want to say. Um, I will not be able to answer all the questions, but I just want to thank you and hope that we will continue this conversation. I will encourage everyone to multiply this conversation. Let's get it out there. It's creating this impact. The president just came out to defend himself. That has never happened. So they have, they've sent Minister of Information people right across uh, the provinces right now as we speak, the Minister of Information or the Minister of Information and the National Commission on Civic Education are going across the country to educate people. The president just launched his own personal website. That is all in response to the African Express, in response to this conversation. If we keep this conversation going and refuse to be distracted by the state, believe you, um, it's going to, we're going to get what we want out of it, which is increased transparency, increased accountability, and to prevent government from carrying out its stealing, including its pending stealing of the votes, its planned stealing of the votes that they want to do. Okay, so, thank yeah. you very much. Um, I want to close by, first of all, thanking the editorial team of the African Express time for to say taking your time to explain to Sierra Leoneans about this current investigation against the President's Bio administration. And I want to thank my distinguished guests on this panel discussion. This is one of our civil rights and responsibility we have just exhibited. And uh, we will continue to do that as a Sierra Leonean, as a citizen of Sierra Leone. It is a right, it is a responsibility to question or to talk about issues that we feel strongly about. So at this juncture, I wanna say thank you. And I want to appeal to every one of us here to continue to use our platform, our different platform to amplify these issues, to talk about these issues. And this forum or this panel discussion is not gonna end here. We're gonna have continuity. We're gonna be having series and series of this discussion engaging uh, um, stakeholders, engaging parliamentarians, engaging citizens to talk about some of this issue. Like um, we all agree, uh, agree here today, this is the first ever this, we have such a panel of this nature. It's a global discussion and we want us to keep the conversation going. So I want to thank you all, my guests. I will not able to mention all of you, but I really, really do appreciate you for taking your time out of your busy schedule to be here to exhibit your social rights and responsibility as Sierra Leonean. Um, I wanna thank you for my, my viewers that has been watching us for the past three hours. It's, a bit, it's been an exhausting, exhausting discussion, I must confess, with all the monies, with all the, you know, the, the questions and answers being said here. I have learned a lot and I believe all of us we have learned a lot from this experience today because we have shared our ideas, our thoughts and the conversation we had on this platform. So like I said, let's keep the conversation going. And anytime, please, when I reach out to you on such a conversation like this or such a discussion like this, please, I, I wish and hope I'll also have an open hand like I did uh, on this conversation today. So I wanna thank you, African Express. Kudos to you, Dr. Anne. Thank you very much. Patrick, thank you very much. Dr. Barry, thank you very much. And the professor, today the Barla has given you a professor to do. Professor Chernoba, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate you. Farala, Jabsina, um, Yusuf, Matilda, Israel, MC, Gifty, all of you, Winston. I cannot mention all of you, but I really do appreciate you. And the man behind all of this technicality, I want to say thank you, Dr. Nana, everybody. Thank you very much. And let's keep the conversation going. Let's 
let's do it in a different platform. Thank you and God bless you and have a happy, happy independence. Sierra Leone at 60. At least we have this conversation going on. It's a plus for us, for us to have this kind of conversation at, on Sierra Leone at 60. I think um, we should continue to do that. God bless you and God bless Sierra Leone. Thank you very much.